to order. If you would, please silence your cell phones. Can you all hear me out there? I hear myself loud and clear, but can you all hear me out there? Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, hey, we're going to leave that door open. We're going to leave that door open tonight. Um, so I, I mentioned to some of you earlier, but for those of you joining, uh, we do have public participation pretty much right up front, but if you're here waiting and you're not comfortable with the crowd for any reason, uh, if you'll just give your name to um, either the chief here or the chief uh, fire chief out in the lobby, feel free to wait outside and we'll call you in during public participation. Um, you don't have to leave, but of course, if you feel comfortable, you can do that. I do have three or four names I'm going to call at that time. So, uh, All right, with that, we call the meeting to order. City Clerk, if you call the roll. Or Sharon, I'm sorry. Please call the roll. Mayor Owen? Here. Vice Mayor Colodi? Here. Commissioner Hartman? Here. Commissioner McGurk? Here. Commissioner Sachs? Here. All right. If you'd like to join us for the invocation, she, uh, Chaplain Sheila Turner with the uh, fire department will give the uh, police department will give the invocation, and then if you remain standing afterwards for the pledge of allegiance. Will we bow our heads and hearts to the Lord? We thank you, Father, for this today. We thank you for all of you have done for us. Excuse me for the mass. I'm sorry. Uh, we thank you for being able to assemble today. And we ask that you bless this agenda that's going to be going forth. Give us a clear mind and clear hearts to make the right decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I get some power down there. Khaled, do you have any changes to the agenda? No changes, sir. No changes. Can they hear us out there, Chief? No? Kelly, can you... Can you see if you can pipe some more volume out to the... the vestibule? All right, we're working on it. I'll try to yell in the meantime. All right, we have no announcements, presentations, or recognitions. This, oh, down, down they're saying. Sorry. <laughs> All right. We're out of practice. We haven't done this live in a while. Okay. Uh, first item is then public participation. Um, so if you would, uh, as you come forward, you're going to have three minutes. I'd ask you to be respectful of that. Uh, as you come to the podium, just try to be mindful. Don't touch that if you can at all possible. And Kelly's going to try to sanitize it between each individual. So... If you're here for public participation, now is your chance to chime in. Come on forward. I won't touch it. I know it's 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 an old it's a tough habit to break. At any rate, uh, Gerard Pendergast, 5900 South Atlantic Avenue, and um, it's kind of hard for me to do this, believe it or not. But I'm here to complain about the homeless situation on Canal Street. Uh, two Fridays ago when I came back from lunch, every single park bench was full of a homeless person. The park had people on the ground passed out. It was ridiculous. And, you know, I've had an office on Canal Street for 15 years now, and I know the one guy that's been there for like 15 years. And I feel bad saying anything, but, you know, I was one of the pioneers that helped get that street going 15 years ago when we were like completely, it looked as bad as the coronavirus days last couple of weeks ago. And we worked really, really hard to revitalize that street between the Chamber of Commerce, the Merchants Associations, and, and we were really successful. And now these merchants are faced with unbelievable challenges trying to rebuild their businesses, and everyone's trying to get back to life. And then we have this homeless situation. And it's gone on and on and on, and I'm sorry, I, I feel like I need to speak up, because we need to do something about this. And when you cross South Dixie Freeway, you will see even more people camped out across the street from Ruthie's. And those, those businesses over there, they really need help. So, I mean, this is really starting to impact the business community. And, you know, this is a low-cost thing. 
I mean, there's precedence set. St. Augustine did it. Daytona Beach did it. And if you read the Sunday paper, Port Orange is getting ready to do it. And so what that means is we're sitting here without an ordinance, and we are going to be inundated with even more of this problem. Miami Beach just passed a bill, no panhandling within 50 feet of a business. So, I mean, the precedent is there. We are not rewriting legal code here. And I really think that it's time. I can't believe we didn't do it two or three years ago when St. Augustine did it. But at any rate, the time is here. And I, as a humanitarian, hate to say this, but, you know, they could, they could pour a nice pad out there by the airport on that vacant lot where the old police station was torn down and put a nice little safe shelter right there on that corner. There's lots of places that people can go, lots of things that things can be done. But we have to get these people out of our business district. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And, Jay, while you're walking back in the next, please come ahead. Um, we are working on scheduling a workshop. I think it's, we're going to, we got to talk about it and figure out the right time, but it will be in the month of June. And it's to talk about exactly everything you just said. Numerous commissioners have brought it up. We've heard this. Um, been, Chief has been on it. Legal counsel has been on it. You're right. We're not rewriting it, but we do have to do it the right way for us. So we do have a workshop that will be scheduled by the end of this meeting to address that. I'm, yes, ma'am. I'm just here to back up Jay and introduce myself, Kathy Saratani, because I had emailed Jay and Jason and you all about the same issue, and I own a home in the Tabby House now. Mm hmm especially during this COVID period. And um, it was becoming concerning, you know, to pay a lot of taxes, pay a, spend a lot of money to build this home. And um, so I just want to introduce myself. <coughs> I've just seen an email. Right. And I had already sent some pictures of other stuff. But I haven't seen a lot of it in the places I saw it uh, since the foot traffic has started again. But I don't, obviously, Jay still seen it in places that I don't see it. <coughs> Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Next up, come on down. You got one coming behind you there, if you don't mind. Nope. And then we'll come to you. And then I'm going to call on those that are outside once we have everybody in the audience. Yeah, go ahead. I, too, am a resident across the street. Um, I did write a letter as well. And I, Mr. Sachs did respond. Thank you very much. Um, mainly, it, it's just getting worse and worse since COVID-19, and my heart goes out to these people. I know that they're, you know, it's an unfortunate situation that they're all facing. But I walk my dog, and, you know, I felt pretty safe. But when they start getting a little aggressive on their bicycles and start to come up to you, and it just gets out of, you know, they're in your zone. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I just wanted to kind of just, you know, kind of support our community. And um, But, again, it's unfortunate, and we hope that you guys can do something. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, and then we'll come to you. Yes, Joe DeLubach, 3587 South the Circle. Uh, three particular items. Uh, wasn't able to keep track, but I think before the board was an ordinance, uh, 2320, dealing with the neutering and spaying of animals, and I believe it, it changed the age from nine months to six months. Uh, I'd just like to remind the board that uh, larger animals, uh, like golden retrievers that we have, uh, they are not recommended to be spayed until they're one year old. Uh, prior to that, it, it detracts from their skeletal development, their facial features and everything, and I would hope that that ordinance had a provision for getting a letter from the veterinarian along for an extension. I'm, but, I'm pretty sure it did, but go ahead. Uh, second, there had been a lot of discussion about stop signs on uh, Live Oak and adjacent streets. Um, there is at the intersection of Pioneer Trail and Tomoka Farm Roads uh, implementation of stop signs and progressive strips on the road. The stop signs are lighted, they're flashing, and that may be an interesting option for satisfying the request uh, for live oak and stuff. That happens to be the corner of uh, Cabbage Patch, by the way. Yep. 
Uh, the other thing on the agenda today is, uh, I believe, the AOB property discussion. Uh, it seems to me like there's a piecemeal approach to what's going on in the North Causeway. We have that, we have the Anglers Yacht Club, we have the Ski Club, we have this, that, and it seems as though we need to step back and, and develop a strategic vision or goal for what we want that area to be. And then it's an integrated facility rather than this piecemeal activity. Uh, if you've not seen it, there's been a lot of discussion on social media everywhere from leave it green to make it a city marina. Uh, be nice to have a workshop addressing that whole subject. Thank you. Thank you. And I, Joe, I was getting the nod that we um, we do have that provision in that ordinance we passed on spay and neutering. I don't know the exact language, but I know there was some carve out for that. So. Good. Thank yeah. you. Next up. Sorry. You're, you're next. <laughs> it's close enough. Go ahead. It doesn't want to work for me. My name's Palmer Wilson. I live at 101 Donlan Drive in New Smyrna Beach. I've written all of you uh, two emails today regarding the two issues I want to talk about tonight, but I would like to express them on the record so that um, you understand the level of my concern. Item one is the proposed charter. While I agree that much of it is just gender neutral corrections and cleaning up or simplifying language, there are several sections that remain needing work and rewrites. Many of these have significant impact on future city operations from both process and cost perspective. For those reasons, I urge you not to place this document as currently written as an all or nothing, up or down vote on the proposed review by the review committee. I further urge you to have a vote on the non-controversial areas and separate votes on the more important issues. Examples of these issues, but not all inclusive, are sections 207, 209, and 504. Each of these needs more careful thought as to use and impact as it will as a rewrite. Additional workshops with the commission and full public participation and discussion are essential components to resolution of these concerns and problems with the draft. With such attention, hopefully we can have a document that meets the needs of our citizens as we go forward. The second issue is the boat trailer parking on the North Causeway uh, and the new park proposal inserted in the agenda as a proposed solution. Let me make it very clear, the proposed park is not a solution to the boat trailer parking issue. It is in fact exacerbates the problem by removing available parking spaces. In addition, with about 20 already existing parks, we do not need nor can we afford another one. The enormous bond issue payments incurred since the construction of the Bannon Center and the acquisition of the Turnbull Creek land and City Hall extension, coupled with certain reduced revenues from impacts of the COVID-19 virus situation, this city will be hurting for revenues and looking to increase taxes without creating this unneeded park. But more importantly, constructing this park does not, repeat, does not solve the boat trailer parking issue. Quite the contrary, it increases the problem by removing currently available spaces. Secondly, parks require continual maintenance expenditures and we do not need more expenditures in light of a budget year. What should be done to solve the problem is to expand the number of boat trailers parking spaces by removing the white fence that shuts off the portion of the public land for use of a specific private service entry. I researched as best I could and could find no public action authorizing that fence. We need to start making money off of land as opposed to always spending money on it. I therefore urge you to take other steps such as increasing the fines, adding towing, booting, and other issues to resolve that issue. Thanks very much for listening to me. Thank you. All right. Next up. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hello. My name is Rachel Allen. I know I've emailed all of you. I live right here at 119 Faulkner Street. So I'm also here to talk about the homeless situation. Um, I'd say probably in the last year, I personally have had about four altercations with a homeless person. Um, one time was actually with my dog. 
um, and the homeless person had a dog. And that was over here at the New Smyrna Church. They were basically, their dog wasn't on a leash. It was dragging behind the dog. I was walking my dog. That dog attacked my dog, who's not very big. <laughs> He's a little guy. So it was pretty intimidating. And, of course, I called law enforcement. And, but if, by the time they got here, she was long gone. And so we filed a report and had my dog checked. And so... Um, there's been a couple other instances. I do have a ring camera on my house, on the front and on the back, so I constantly am seeing the homeless um, prowling around. It's the only way I can say it. So they, they're always looking down the little alleys between our houses and things like that. So that's kind of scary, and it's all hours of the morning. And then a recent situation I had happen was, this is all personally, was I walk in the park over here um, every morning, and... <clears throat> After my walk, I was walking home and had a homeless person pretty much come up to me and was, like, almost touching me, which, you know, we have all this stuff going on with this COVID and germs and things like that, so it was pretty freaky. And I'm a pretty tough one. I, I can usually hold my own, but I wasn't expecting that, and he was just right on me, and it was pretty scary. So I, you know, immediately asked him to back away. He told me he either wanted food, drugs, or money, and I... <laughs> Again, told him to back away. Really just tried to get away from him as fast as I could, um, get myself home. But he actually started following me, so that was pretty scary. And so I had to get into, like, a run and kind of go into the back alley of my house so that I could make sure he didn't see where I actually lived. Pretty scary. In addition to that, um, you know, every time I turn around, there's they're, they're everywhere. And I do have a heart for these people. I understand that, like, you know, we, we could all be that way one day. But when it becomes a nuisance to business owners, I personally have a business, and I have a tenant who has a business in addition to I live here. So it's, it's really, really upsetting to me that this is affecting my tenants, myself, my customers, my clients. Everybody's kind of like, what's going on? They're always asking me, thinking I know why the population is so big with all of the homeless. So I just appreciate anything that you guys can do to help us citizens and taxpayers here in New Samarta Beach City. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. Charlotte, Charlotte, you're next. Come, come ahead, sir. You're fine. Charlotte, go first? No, you're fine. Come ahead. Good evening. I'm here on behalf of uh, Beachy Beans, formerly Nichols Surf Shop on Flagler Avenue. And my primary reason for being here is in reference to the uh, possibility that we're going to make some loading zones permanent on Flagler. And I understand that you folks are in a catch-22 situation, parking, unloading, blocking traffic. But the first thing I'd like to do is commend the police chief and whoever was responsible for your presence on the street this weekend. It was commendable and it was... Uh, it, it was needed, and uh, anybody that I associate with in business down there, it hasn't gone unnoticed. It was mentioned repeatedly over the last couple of days, so that was really appreciated. Uh, I, uh, I found out about the uh, loading zone parking uh, through uh, FABA, the, uh, and I looked online at the uh, email, and it referenced uh, the 100 block. So quite frankly, I, I didn't give it a hard look. And then when I got a call from uh, uh, an engineer that does work for me and told me that they were planning a sign out in front of my place uh, for a loading zone. So I, I took a close look at the uh, email and the proposed uh, parking, uh, or excuse me, loading zones. And I'm paraphrasing, but... Uh, in front of our establishment and one other, it essentially said that ours was the least desirable. So I, I didn't take a real interest in it because I, I honestly didn't think that, uh, that it would be placed there. So in doing that, I just uh, I took into consideration, and, and I would hope you, the board would take into consideration, uh, what we really have in that 400 block, uh, there's, there's us, there's uh, Peanuts, uh, the Flagler Tavern, uh, Tatons, 
And that comprises the majority of people that would get any type of delivery. Tatons take their, are now, they tore down a house, spent a substantial amount of money where they'll take their deliveries from the, the rear. Uh, Peanuts already take their deliveries from the rear. Uh, the Flagler Tavern has probably the best setup uh, for deliveries, and they don't have any deliveries on the street. And quite frankly, the, uh, the only uh, person there that stop in front of our place is for about uh, a minute to get a coffee order once, once a week. So the other thing is that our business is one of the few that open and we do the majority of our business from 7 to 11 in the morning, which is when that's designated. So I hope you just use some logic and reason, look into this. It is what it is. Thank you for sharing that perspective. And this is just an initial six-month trial, so we're certainly going to be taking that kind of feedback in as we examine these zones. So, Shona, you're up. <laughs> Don't touch. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. How are you? Good. Can you hear me? Can yes. I, can I kind of do this? Like yeah, go for it. Said go for it. You're on mine. Um, Charlotte Smith, 116 uh, Turnbull Villa Circle, New Smyrna Beach. But I am here for Exit Real Estate Property Solutions. And there's part of me that wants to do this and say, we're back. Um, yes, you, each of you commissioners, including Khaled, you have an email today in your email from White Development. <coughs> Excuse me. I couldn't cough in public from White Development. Um, White Development has been, and I'm going to read you just a couple of sections of it. Um, White Development has been working with the city of New Smyrna Beach since 2013 when uh, the AOB site was first proposed for sale. Since then, our company has submitted several proposals to every request for, produ for proposal that was issued. In March of 2015, our proposal to purchase and develop a standalone grocery store, and they've even given me permission to go ahead and tell you, yes, it's Publix. We kept it quiet before, supposedly. Um, and they said that they, you know, develop a standalone grocery store, and it was considered by the city, but we got beat out by the marina. We were hoping that we could shoot right in after the marina, you know, failed, but apparently not. So what this letter is saying and what I'm here to say is white development is ready to step up. Um, in my terms, they're ready to write a check. They <coughs> will move forward on the AOB site. They are willing to come meet with you. They are willing to sit down, give you plans, show you what they'll do, whatever you want. They want a high-end, the uh, Greenwise Publix grocery store. It will, again, be perpendicular to the road so that you don't obstruct the view. They're willing to do your park. They're willing to, as before, they were going to do the whole walkway around the front so that that is preserved. And they'll deed that back to you. They even offered to give you that. It's almost an acre, that, that walkway around there. They'll deed it back to you. So you're preserved. Um, so anyway, that, that's what I want to tell you. And also, think about it. If we can have a, a little bit of a park, they're going to do seating. They'll do your kayak launches. They're going to have nice, nice food, nice, nice little grocer there. And, and yet you'll have your commercial offset some of our residential budget, you know, have a little commercial in there. So, um, yes, we're back and um, we look forward to meeting with you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Something about that seat right there, Commissioner McGurk. Like you, they like to look at you right there. <laughs> No, so everybody, everybody tonight, they're kind of taking it all, all out on you over there. No, it's, a, it's okay. It's good. All right, we'll call in um, the, the, the Daughtry family. Daughtry party of three, I think, out there waiting. So um, whatever order you all care to, to come in. And then Cody Moore will have you after when they, when they finish. Yes, ma'am, go right in. Sarah Doherty, 607 North Riverside, Edgewater. So I have a question for all of you all. Do you realize how much money boating brings into our Congressional District 6? 
I bet you've got that figure. <laughs> Almost a billion dollars. So that's a lot of money um, that we're putting at risk, not just, okay, take it back. The whole state has a problem. New Smyrna also has a problem, but so does Port Orange, Edgewater, um, Oak Hill even, for boat parking. Um, we've got a, over 20 parks here in New Smyrna. I don't understand why we need to take the AOB site and get rid of all of the boat parking. Um, I think we can all collectively say that we don't let our children go to some of these parks because of what people have already mentioned. Uh, New Smyrna is a waterfront community. That's why we all moved here. Some of you were probably raised here. I moved here because of the waterfront. I want my children to enjoy the same waterfront. Uh, we're boat builders, so we have employees who also want to enjoy the waterfront. There's plenty of space north of here where there's already a boat ramp. There's just no parking spaces. So I think we need to better utilize uh, some of the land that we have. Uh, poor planning, I know we sat here in 2006 talking about parking at the boat ramp, how to redesign the boat docks to allow for better access, and uh, we didn't get anywhere. We got a paved parking lot, which I was okay with Shell. Um, so I'm asking you guys to please utilize the park for parking so that we have access to the best park in the United States, which is our intercoastal waterway, the ocean, and Mosquito Lagoon. Thank you. Next up, <laughs> she brought a fan club. That's almost no fair. That's all right. Next up, uh, whoever's whoever's next. My name. <laughs> so I'm Laura Doherty, and I'm I live on 1805 Indian River Road, um, off of Peninsula, and I'm a boater, and I'm a you know I own. Um, a boat repair shop, and, you know, I also lived on Quay Sissy for 12 years, so I know that the parking for the trailers is just crazy. They park wherever they can, on the side of the road, you know, down the street, wherever, um, and it's obvious that we do need more parking because, you know, our town is just growing as far as boaters. We have more and more that just keep coming and I agree that we have you know four boat manufacturers in this area and so it's obvious to me that this is what this community is based on it's the waterfront we have plenty of beach we again we have parks everywhere for the kids um, I don't know why we would put another park there that would you know you'd have to pay money to maintain it and then it would attract some things that we probably don't want, we have enough of. Um, and so I would say that some more trailer parking would be great. Um, and I also think that it would make it, um, I think that it would blend in with what is already there. You've got the marina, you know, you've got outriggers. And to me, it's just a natural thing. It would bring us revenue that this town is going to need because with this virus, um, it's obvious that, you know, we're going to have a big revenue problem, and to me it's just obvious. Why spend more money to maintain something that we don't need, serves no purpose, you know, because we have plenty of it already uh, where we could put more parking for trailers um, and make some money while we're at it. I just, thank you. Thank you. All right, Steve. I'm clearing the, clearing the folks that are waiting, and then I'll come to you, sir. Not that you're not waiting also, but I had them on a, had them on a list. Yes, sir. My name is Stephen Doherty, and I live at uh, 607 North Riverside Drive in, in Edgewater. Um, so, yes, we have boat businesses in town. I moved here because of the waterfront. I'm not sure why you all moved here, but I think it probably had something to do with the water. Now, I'm fortunate enough that I have a house on the river. And I, my boat is in my backyard. But there's a lot of people that can't afford that luxury. And they are, they're here to boat. They fish. Their livelihood is with boating. And they take their families on the boat. What a better thing to do than to take your family on the boat. We look at, <clears throat> a lot of people look at the trailer parking over there and blame it on the boaters. 
it's not the boaters fault it's our fault for screwing this up and having poor planning from day one we need to plan our future and our future is that people move here for our waterfront so look around our state and what happens out in the middle of nowhere Florida a little community out there what kind of tax revenue do they have they got nothing now maybe by Universal Studios and Disney they've got an attraction our attraction is our waterfront we have the best waterfront some people think in the world we need to do some better planning have better access to the water for the people who can't afford it and we should look around that entire site there's a there's a piece of property right across the street for sale maybe we should look at buying that property and increasing the boat parking or the trailer parking and we could probably raise fees I'm okay with that we should put in a couple more ramps we should redesign the entire site um, put in some more boat docks make it easier for people to load and unload and give our community something they can use go around and look at all the parks count the people in the parks I did I counted six over here three over there a couple of bums over here and then we want to go in and we want to put in a splash park we might as well supply people with soap so they can take their showers in a splash park that's the wrong thing to do and to let our little kids go out there and play when we've got trucks and trailers driving around and maybe fall in the river somebody needs to think more about that now when I go on a boat one of the first things I get is a Publix chicken it's the best thing to have on the boat and I can find a Publix within 10 minutes of anywhere in our community I don't think we need a Publix on a waterfront we need to save our waterfront for the waterfront access and we need to look towards increasing our waterfront access not decreasing it thank you thank you all right I had one more of those waiting outside I'm gonna clear that and then we'll go back to just anybody else would like to participate mr. Moore come on in Uh, two reasons I'm here. The first is what Jay mentioned earlier was the homeless people. Definitely have a big issue with that. I don't have to go back and say what he already said because <clears throat> constantly using the bathroom in public, approaching me and my employees over there when you're trying to go to work. You know, so there's constantly issues asking for money, running their, leaving their crap everywhere, half naked in the park. Uh, so pretty much what he had already said. So I don't have to go through all that again. Uh, but the next thing that I'm here for is the boat ramp parking. Uh, <clears throat> like everyone before me said, I don't see why we need another park. You know, when you can actually stand on that property where the boat ramp is and see other parks, you know, from that property that aren't utilized. That you know, we go over there in the afternoon and there's again homeless people sleeping on the benches and using the bathroom and whatnot in public. Uh, and like Ms. Doherty said before, boating brings a tremendous amount of money to, to the local economy. Crazy. I mean, I can tell you just from being over here in my shop, uh, you know, you've got, whether they're from Orlando or, you know, St. Augustine, wherever they're from, they come down, uh, you know, they'll, they put their boat in over here. Before they do that, they stop, they grab stuff at the local store, gas station, whatever, fill their boat up with fuel, stop at the marina, you know get bait, get ice, all that stuff, stop in my store and buy tackle. They get off the water, they stop back by at the furniture stores and all the places on Canal or Flagler or wherever, uh, if they can find a place to park. And then they go and they grab dinner somewhere in a corkscrew or wherever. And then they leave and go out of town. So I think it's uh, overlooked how much money they bring to the local economy. And doing away with, everyone says, you know, News from Runner, it doesn't know whether to accept the growth or fight it. I mean, either way, it's growing. So you can either, you know, go with it and help it grow, or you can go against it and make all the people mad. And it's not going to help. Doing away with parking isn't going to do anything because the amount of boats is still coming. 
amount of people are still coming. Raise the fines, they're still going to park. They're going to get the fine. So if you can figure out a way to utilize that property other than a park like the other 20 or 25 we got, then, you know, I think it would help out a lot. All right. Thank you, Cody. Any others for po Oh, yes, sir. Yep, go ahead. <laughs> Forgot. Yeah. If you'd like to speak after him, let's get ready. Okay, I'm here to give money away. All right. I'm around 517 White Coral Lane, New Smyrna Beach. Um, due to the uh, coronavirus situation, the city outdoor facilities, the parks, must be maintained for the use of the residents. I will address two such facilities needing immediate attention. The problem area is the court surfaces at Live Oak and Pettis Park. They are deteriorating and need immediate attention to assure that the particip participants remain safe. All courts are de developing cracks and the cracks will continue to widen. I measured <coughs> the linear footage of the cracks of the immediate playing area, not the entire surface, but just the immediate playing area. And here are the results. Pettis Park, South Court, 151 linear feet. North Park, 120 linear feet. Tennis Court, 138. North Park at Live Oak, 99. Middle Court, Live Oak, 120. South at Live Oak, 148. Solution, the cracks need to be filled in matching paint needs to be applied to the affected area. I do not believe the courts need an entire resurface at this time. However, they will need to be resurfaced in the near future. The New Smyrna Beach Pickleball Club will supply the labor to complete the repair if the city will supply the necessary materials. I will work with the city personnel to ensure appropriate materials will be utilized. Secondary, I've been in contact with the city about installing screening on the east and west side of the pickleball courts of Live Oak. From the beginning, the club has agreed to share in the cost of the screening. With the financial drain on the city's funds, the New Smyrna Beach Pickleball Club will completely pay 650 dollars to purchase and install the screening. The specifications of the screening have been supplied to leisure services. And that's basically it. One other question. Does the city have a sign department to make signs? We do. Well, we have, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Mr. Brown, first of all, thank you. I mean, I re really appreciate this and the, and the great relationship we've always had with the Pickleball Club. So I, I know you probably have Khaled's contact info, but if not, I think his business cards are out there in front of you. And so if you'll grab that and connect with Khaled, and um, he, can, he can walk you through if we can pursue this. Not certainly, I think the screening, um, I mean, it's a very generous offer by the club. So uh, Khaled, if you'll connect with Mr. Brown and the club and see what we can, see what we can do on this. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Do you have a yeah. comment? Sure. Both those courts were just recently done, so we may need to look into the original um, contractor who did that and see if we have a warranty service or if they're under that's warranty a, in any way. They're not more than a year old, are they? Or just over a year? The one at Pettis Park? The one at Pettis Park was just recently done. I think done. they did the, uh, the pickleball court, but not the basketball court, so... No, they did the pickleball and the tennis court at Pettis Park. Which is what he's talking about here. Yeah. Which and is what he's talking about. The Live Oak is over, too, because yeah. it was done before I took yeah, off. Yeah, it was done when we opened Live Oak's Cultural Center. So we'll look at so both about that, too. Look yeah. see if there's any kind of warranty with those. Yeah. With the original contractor. All right. Khaled, you and Mr. Brown will be in touch. Thank you. Any others for public participation? Joel, come ahead. While he's, and then you can come after that. While he's coming, I would say if you've already spoken, the meeting is being live streamed, so you're welcome to stay for the entire meeting. Um, but if you want to go grab dinner or just not be around a crowd, uh, the meeting is available on YouTube. If you don't know how to find it, you can check with the, uh, the, the tech on the way out the door, and he'll tell you how to find the YouTube channel. 
Yes, Mr. Page. Good evening, everybody. Joel Page. I live on 12th Avenue, New Smyrna Beach. Um, for the last uh, few weeks, there's been some phone calls and um, uh, group phone calls on <coughs> about uh, what we're doing here in New Smyrna to increase the tourism, I guess, to bring it back. And, um, and uh, I think the mayor was on the one I was on Kicked also. Kicked one off, yeah. And we brought up... Um, a few things. One was closing the streets, and I guess that was kind of a little controversial. But what was also brought up was adding more outdoor seating to the existing restaurants now. And I was wondering if and when, if that's going to happen, that we make sure that we have a clear and concise policy decision about it. Because, you know, sometimes things don't, aren't clear, clear cut as to the rules and you know, so forth. Uh, that worked at, an example of that is when we had the sandwich board signs on the streets. Some people put them up and they got code enforced, you know, yeah. cited and then other people put them up and they didn't and it, 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 just no clear policy on that. So, you know, I just hope if, if and when, and I hope it does happen, we, I'd like to see more outdoor seating on, uh, in New Smyrna Beach. Owning a restaurant, no. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so Brian can give m more details, but we do. Did, if you had anything else, uh, this is still your time. But if not, I can. We do have a program in place, and we've actually had a few restaurants that have already taken advantage of it. So Brian can share some details with you now, just briefly, and then if need be, connect with you after. Yes, we uh, adopt. Should I finish talking first? Yeah, yeah if you have more, good. Yeah, I do. I was also. Uh, I know the AOB site's another issue that's coming up now, and I was at. The original meetings back, I guess it was 2009 or 2010 or something, where it was decided that it was going to be sold to somebody and then, you know, and I was up there trying to tell, you know, to push for exactly what you guys are trying to do now. But I was pushing for the New Smyrna Beach Museum of East Coast Surfing to get a spot there um, as part of the park. Uh, an attraction there, um, but that didn't happen. And then, but another um, nonprofit did get a spot there, and I'm just wondering how that happened. Um, whereas we were trying to push for it, but then another nonprofit got a spot there with a dock and um, and did block it off there for a while um, to everybody to the to the public after that was a public dock put in by. Um, the fine group. So I just hope when the AOB site comes up this time that it's, it's more, you know, spread around as instead of uh, certain groups getting preference over other groups. Okay. So uh, thank you for those comments. What I'll have is, uh, it, it, I don't know if Brian, your card may not be up there, but um, I think it is. Is, is, do you see a card for Brian? If you grab Brian's card or if you just reach out to, you know how to find city staff, if you'll reach out to Brian, he can walk you through the program and how to do the outdoor seating because we do have a program. It's on the okay. website, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's already it's on, the, on the website. Yeah. There's, there's a program so it's for done, it. Set up, it's approved. For temp yeah. Temporary outdoor seating. Yep. So. Thank you. Any others for public participation? Yes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And then I'll come to you. Top of the evening. My name is Wes Maylar. I live at 1050 Old Mission Road, and I'm here for the Horvath. They're building the high-end dog care place, and they're looking for a uh, minor exception to be able to do it. Um, that particular area could really use a high-end dog care. Around, I travel all through the area. I work on dogs and horses. I'm an equine therapist work on dogs also. <laughs> Everybody that I talk to is excited about having a place where they can go on vacation. Where we live in the park, all the winter people, when they start taking off and leave for a week or three or four days, there is no place that they feel comfortable with. It's very difficult for them to get in to the vet boarding. And um, there's one place on Taylor Road and it's not really up to the standards of what's going to go in there. Not only will it present new jobs 
to the people making twelve, fifteen, eighteen dollars an hour in a chance to grow with the business. The people have been here for over fifteen years. They are knowledgeable, great people, and definitely know what's going on. Um, so that's not a long thing to say, but Thank everybody you. that I talk to traveling the entire area around here is excited about it and hope that you guys will go ahead and allow them to do that. Plus, the Thank area where they're building is a little bit run down. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yes, sir. How are you doing tonight? Uh, Troy Sutton, 119 Faulkner Street. Um, I, I just saw on Facebook uh, the golf cart track that we're supposed to take up on the North Causeway. Goes down Quay Sissy, comes back up, goes over, and then finally hits Boatyard Road and goes up. Um, and it just triggered me with this whole boat ramp thing, <laughs> is that why don't we just extend out the .3 miles, the 35-mile-an-hour zone to Boatyard, because most people are going to those, uh, you know, going to the boat ramp anyways. We go fishing over there, um, using a golf cart and whatnot on on the whole North Causeway. But you know, just extend out that 35 mile an hour zone so we can go up to and turn right instead of crossing over twice um, on across North Causeway through the lights. Uh, I just think it'd be a safer thing. Also, it slows the traffic down up to the point where the medians have been put in that. Causes people to go a little bit slower right there when, you know, instead of 45, 50 miles an hour. Um, and actually have them, you know, extend it out to there and and be safe for the boat ramp, people coming in and out. Um, thank you. All right. So I can tell you, I literally not an hour ago talked to our city manager about that. I said, hey, it makes sense to me. Why don't we do it? And the answer is that's DOT controlled. And so if you can convince the DOT, we haven't been able to. But if you can convince the DOT, we had a private citizen before that was able to get it, I think, from 40 to 35. Um, but if, if you can convince them, but that is both of those elements, actually. The fact that the low-speed vehicles can only be on roads under that are 30 or below is a state-level thing. And then the 35-mile power zone there is driven by DOT, which is also state-level. So it's not something that this body, neither of those can we can necessarily fix right here. Moving the, moving the speed limit up. What's the DOT have to say about that? It's moving a sign 0.3 miles just past the actual <laughs> the, 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 stop, I, the stop light. I hear you. I feel like they might have something to say about that, but I don't know. We can <laughs> give it a shot. We'll do it one night maybe. I don't know. My recommendation is 35 all the way down. This is all on the record, just so, just for the record. <laughs> the DOT can watch this. So. Yes, that's, that's perfectly yeah. fine. I'll speak with them. So. Yeah. And thank you, sir, for uh, taking care of the generator alarm. I <laughs> All right, any others for public participation? Seeing none, we will close public participation. Uh, and we do have a couple of public hearings, uh, so if you're for one of those items that are under that item, under the public, uh, that is a quasi-judicial public hearing, you will have a chance to speak at that time on those items if you so desire. Uh, and again, if you're here for anything in particular and you wanted to join virtually, more than welcome to do that. Next item up is consent agenda. We have eight items. Does anyone wish to pull anything from the consent agenda? We'll just go right, left to right. Mr. Hartman. Item D. Item D is Hartman. Vice Mayor. F. Item F. F is Vice Mayor. Commissioner McGurk. Uh, no, I have nothing. Thank you. Commissioner Sachs. Nothing to pull. All right. If not, any further things to pull? Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items A through H, excluding item D and F? Make that motion. Second. I have a motion by the vice mayor, second by Commissioner McGurk. City clerk, if you'd call the roll, please. Or Sharon, if you'd call the roll, please. Sorry. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. Commissioner Hartman? Yes. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Commissioner Sachs? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Hartman, item D. So on item number D, we're looking to approve the street lights for the parking lot at the annex property over here. 
Um, I'd ask the city manager uh, about whether or not that was an item that was in the original budget and whether it was originally budgeted, um, how much money was set aside for that, whether the existing electrician was supposed to do that. And, and then also, my, I'm curious as to if we purchase the lights, what is our long-term cost going to be? If we're going to purchase our lights from the UC and then rent them on a monthly basis like we do every street light, over the course of the lifetime of those lights, we're paying a tremendous amount of money for those lights. And what are our options? Before I go and approve this, I'd like to know what my options are. What is my real cost going to be if we purchase the lights from a manufacturer? If we have to have a contract with an electrical company to change the bulbs or whatever on a, you know, every so months or whatever. I think that the sports complex is doing that now. So I, I've just, there's not enough, I needed more information, and unfortunately we weren't able to get to that information today. So I would make a motion to table this until the next meeting, until we can get a little bit more information, and we can have a, a clear picture of what actually we're spending, and how much we're going to spend, and what our costs are going to be long term. Okay, had a motion to table item D until the next meeting. Do I have a second? Second for discussion. I have a second. Uh, any discussion on that? Go yes. Ahead. Commissioner um, City Manager, is there a time issue on this? No, I think it's my suggestion would be to uh, postpone it to the 9th. I think we'll have more information and detailed information on it. All right. Thank you. And that's funny because I had similar questions about you know, why was this coming out of contingency and so um, didn't go as far as you did, though, so good good catch. So I had a motion and a second on item D to delay it until our next meeting and staff to provide some more information working with Commissioner Hartman. Uh, Sharon, if you'd call the roll on that motion, please. Commissioner Hartman? Yes. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Commissioner Sachs? Yes. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. Um, before we go further, we, we approved item E, but obviously that would be contingent on D, I guess, so that's all. <laughs> they won't do anything with E if we don't do D, I guess. Uh, item F, Vice Mayor? Yeah, I just have some comments on it. Uh, as a result of one of our hurricanes, uh, it was determined that there are a number of structures on the beach side that are subjected to frequent uh, damage due to hurricanes. We applied, or a previous, uh, previous commission agreed to apply for a grant from the federal government, and, which is for 75% of the funds, the remaining 25% to be paid for locally. Uh, the previous commission agreed to uh, split that cost with the individual homeowners. Uh, bottom line, federal government's paying $1.175 million. Uh, the, the local share is $380-some thousand dollars, and we will be paying out of our stormwater fund $195,000. I have no objection to this, and I will vote to support it. Uh, however, I think in the future, um, if this comes about again, I would not support paying money to a certain amount of individuals to improve their property. Um, but program was set up. The program was approved by previous commissions. I'm sure they took uh, into account all those factors. So just saying that, I'll make a motion to approve it. Just to clear, Mr. Mayor, uh, yes, uh, the fifty percent of the twenty-five percent is up to thirty-five thousand. So, yeah. per Mayor? individual property, per so individual. it may actually come less. But in no event will be it over one hundred ninety-five thousand eight hundred sixty-five dollars. Mr. Mayor, yes. comment, please. Sure. I had I actually I had a motion on the table. Let me I'll make sure. The motion. Well, yeah, we got to second, second Go ahead. for discussion then. Yes. Um, you know, this is a mystery wrapped in an enigma because I have a paragraph here from when we voted on this item. There were several tiers on uh, who was going to get repaired, demolished, assisted, first or second. We had two tiers. And uh, Commissioner McGurk may remember when we voted on this. And I thought it was a fair idea. Let's help people get through that first hurricane. After that, you may be on your own. Uh, FEMA may not help you. The city may not help you. But we, we made this agreement. 
But what I still don't understand, and I'd like it made clear, if not even for me, but for the residents, because it seems not fair. We, we have Tier 1 and Tier 2, and then we've combined the two tiers. We had over well over 20 applicants, and now we end up with nine, I think, college. So, it, you know, it's a, it's a question of what are we actually doing for the public, and when is the time span that this will take place? Commissioner Sachs, the, the nine that you have is, is only one uh, topic, which is that's the elevation project. You still have the, the demo and rebuild. That's a separate grant from this one. So you still have the 29 on the table. Uh, the other two, they're still actually in, in pending process. This nine uh, projects here was denied twice, and we had to go back and, and just keep fighting for it. So you haven't lost anything yet, so... It, how did we end up combining tiers, tier one and tier two? It's, I don't think it was combined. What happened is it just in, in preparation for in case of, for example, we had more money that we put tier two. But typically what happened is they would look at the repetitive loss and there's so much documentation that there's some houses that were not approved because they didn't have insurance claims. They didn't have any pictures. So uh, it's not an easy process. But we have no time span, though. We have no time frame. Well, usually it takes about two to two and a half years, and this has been going on just about that. So as soon as we figure out from FEMA, and, you know, the COVID really kind of put us, I guess, behind. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of a complex situation. I, I would like to see it. everybody uh, have a fair shake at this. And I would approve it as well. Okay. Thank you. I think the critical thing that I remember from the, the presentation that I went through on this with all the residents was that we, at that time, but I don't think we'd even been, de been denied the second time, but I mean, we, we've truly been trying to navigate a really tight rope to try to get these approved, facing two denials and continuing to go back to this. So, you know, I, I don't I don't think the question is that we've tried to leave people out. I think we're trying to find, like, can, can we get anything approved? Um, so... Uh, but I actually tend to agree with uh, Vice Mayor in general. But you know, this this ship has long since sailed. So, I had a motion and a second. If no other discussion on this item, City uh, Sharon, if you would call the roll, please. Commissioner Sachs. Yes. Vice Mayor Colodi. Yes. Commissioner Hartman. Yes. Commissioner McGurk. Yes. Mayor Owen. Yes. All right. Your your name by the end of this will be City Sharon, I believe. <laughs> I keep starting to say city clerk. All right. Uh, item, next item up that clears the consent agenda. Item 7A is the AOB boat ramp discussion. Um, Mayor, at the, uh, the last meeting, uh, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Colodi has requested for this item to be on the agenda. Uh, that was supposed to be for general discussion. I think the, as a result of the uh, boat ram uh, activities that happened uh, the past three weeks, I think that generated the discussion that he wanted to bring up and have a, a consensus from the commission on a direction to, to the staff. Um, he asked us to attach uh, the two plans that we prepared pre previously, which mm -hmm. were attached in this uh, uh, agenda. Uh, so staff is ready to answer any questions that you might have. All right, we'll let Vice Mayor kick it off since it was his item that he added. Okay, the boat ramps are in Zone 1. Obviously, I live in Zone 1, and I also happen to live near the boat ramp, so I get to see them repeatedly. It's total chaos and total disruption for the residents out there. We have very strict enforcement uh, at the boat ramp. We have very strict enforcement in the North Beach area. We're doing our best. We have the police force stretched to the limits. We have police coming in from other towns to assist us. What this all is, is bringing to the forefront the fact that New Smyrna Beach is bearing the brunt of recreational needs for what appears to be the entire eastern half of Florida, 
through the Central Florida area. We get no assistance for this. The county makes independent decisions about the beach. They decide that they would like a little extra spacing of cars on the beach. They don't do anything to stop the number of people from coming. So people drive an hour, they drive an hour and a half, they drive here, they can't get on the beach, they park in our residents' yards, they park in their driveways, we enforce the heck out of it, but still it is to the point where I can't leave my house sometimes on a busy weekend. People who live in the North Beach area are literally trapped by the number of vehicles and the number of people coming to that area. Uh, I know that stretches a little far from the boat ramp, but the two things are symptomatic of the fact that we simply are being overwhelmed and we can't handle it. We have to do something. There's a couple provisions regarding uh, fines and loading, our loading zones or one attempt at that. But what I would like to do regarding the boat ramp, um, I'm glad to see that the public reads the, uh, the agenda. They look at the pictures and they saw a plan from the, for improving the boat ramp into a park that was prepared a number of years ago. And there's no way in heck that I would want to see that. It's total overdevelopment. I want to see a good part of that area set aside for the enjoyment of the waterway. I don't want to see uh, swim parks. I don't want to see pavilions. I don't even want to see another restroom built out there because there already is one. But yet, the size of that site is the only open area along the waterway that people can enjoy the waterway. They come to Riverside Park, yes, but Every day, as I go back and forth past that, there's generally a dozen cars along the water there that are that are people simply enjoying the water without any real facilities. So I don't want to see any real facilities there. Then you go to the issue of the boat trailers. There are a limited number of boat ramps. As the host city, we do have to help out people to go there and park there but it does not mean we take four, approximately four acres of prime park-like area along the river and turn it into a boat parking facility that's used two days a week for maybe six months out of the year. It's a total waste of one of our assets. If we have 20 parks, and that's too many parks, I know Commissioner Hartman has asked for an inventory, maybe some of those parks shouldn't be used to the extent they are, and maybe maintenance should be cut down, or maybe some should even be sold. Times change, people's desires change, and they need to be addressed. I would like to see additional boat parking at that facility. Right now, we have 45 designated spaces. On the other boat ramp, we have 12 haphazard boat spaces for 57 boats. I counted them about three weeks ago on one of our busy weekends. There was 263 boat trailers parked at one time, not counting those going in and out on a regular basis. There's no way in heck we will ever be able to provide enough boat parking there to meet the needs of half of the central part of Florida. I would like to see some improvements. I would like to see perhaps 50 additional spaces be put out there for boat trailers, and the remainder of it left for the enjoyment, basically, of our residents, the main people who go to that area. They sit and they enjoy uh, the quiet. We can't keep going on with this. We now have a proposal back again to build a supermarket there. My wife would love it, but I don't think that would serve the needs of our city uh, to do that. I would like the commission to be able to come to a consensus as to a plan such as this, uh, limiting the, the development there to more of an open play area and some additional boat parking. 
should be noted that by having an open field area there in the public area, if we do have a special event on Flagler Avenue or in the, uh, in the Canal Street area, that that could be used for overflow parking. It wouldn't just be there. It would, it would preserve the space and it would have some, some general use. I'd like the commission to consider asking the staff to move forward with, I believe it was concept A, to put in approximately 53 new trailer spaces. It would also include 40 parking spaces for single vehicles there, and it would preserve over half the property, the water side half of the property, for uh, the open uh, use of our citizens, whether driving by or whether sitting there. Now, we must remember the overflow parking area there now is used maybe two days on a week during the summer season and nothing in the winter season, virtually nothing in the fall and nothing in the spring until the water heats up. Gee, what will we have then? We'll have a nice, clear, open view to the waterway. It benefits our na it benefits Zone One tremendously. It benefits anybody traveling on that road to the beach, not to see a jumble of trailers all over the place, not to see them in the uh, other commercial facilities. That's that's what I want. Come. I get almost done. I get a tremendous number of calls uh, every weekend for three or four days to trail that from people in the area because of the boat trailers. Uh, this last weekend, some people couldn't even turn in off Route 1 because the line of boat trailers extended all the way out uh, to the Dixie Freeway. Uh, perhaps the uh, county will come to its senses and help to provide some more parking facilities, both for the beach and the boat trailers. Not just in our city, but in some of the other ones that uh, have these facilities. I look for the consideration of the commission on this and would love to hear your comments. Okay. Quick quick question, and then we'll open up for other comments. You said, and it was probably somewhere in the package, but I missed it. How many, how many spaces are there now, boat trailer spaces? I counted 45 okay. paved. Yeah. At the west paved. boat ramp, 12. Uh, at the east boat ramp, which are not marked and they're kind of spread around. Yeah, uh, when, yeah. you, when you go there at that time, people park in the handicapped parking areas, they park in the trash areas, they park in the, in the driveways. Yeah, okay. It's, it's a real problem. Other comments? Oh, yes. Well, you know how valuable that piece of land is to the citizens, to people who love the water. I've wanted it to be a park for a long time. Was looking for some compromise. Certainly not a Publix. Certainly not a hotel. But open space. This city is about to grow by approximately 20 to 25 percent in the next 10 years. If we have 20 some odd parks, we'll need every bit of that open space. If you wish to look at the inventory and delete a few that are not used, I would be open to looking at that. But that AOB site is prime waterfront property for use by the citizens. A very simple passive park would have a nominal cost. Now, Vice Mayor Colodi mentioned approximately 50 more spaces. I would be willing to compromise. I like the win-win. We've heard this many times before. It would be a win-win for the citizens. We could provide open space for a father and son to throw a frisbee or a football. We could provide a living shoreline with a primitive dock for kayaks and stand-up paddle boards. We could provide the path that would connect the waterfront loop. Imagine the waterfront loop, something we conceived years ago already. But Mike, I, I have to disagree on the number of spots because I'm afraid that if we have too many spots for truck and trailer, will impede the look of the, of the actual open space. I would be willing to compromise to go back to the, to the marina site, to the pier, the ramp, and add additional spaces along that 
side, along that eastern side, to adjoin the current parking as it is. The other parking I would put on the westerly side. So you could keep the main space as you walk by, you would see the water. You'd see possibly some palm trees that we could put in. And that, that's the passive, inexpensive part. Look, there may be homeless people anywhere and everywhere. Just drive up to Savannah and see how many homeless people are in the choicest parts of town. We're, we're going to have to face that everywhere we go. But that shouldn't stop us from having one of the, the choicest opportunities for park. We have Manatee Riverside. It faces east. We could have the AOB site, which is much with a much better name, hopefully Barracuda Park or something like that, facing south. And how enviable that would be for the public. And how proud we could all be that we made that into a park and additional parking space for boat and trailer. But don't forget, there's no infinite abundance of anything. Not water, not trees, not parking spaces for boats. I appreciate more people want to come here. I've got a little skiff. I don't happen to use that ramp. I go down to Canaveral. But I appreciate how crowded it can get. But we can't provide boat uh, parking for everybody. You get there early. You want to go boating? You get there early. And I, I, you know, I feel for the people who build boats who want to use it for selling more boats and for maintaining boats and servicing boats. That's fine. But you get there early, and I can't see making that whole AOB site into a into a parking area. So you got my thoughts. Okay. Thanks. Others. You want to go first? It will still. I'll let y'all sort it out. We're on that side of the room. All right. <laughs> okay. So the AOB site, obviously, we've been talking about this for many for decades. And the reason is because it's very controversial. The bottom line is a lot of people have a different opinion on what it should be. Now I will tell you that the best thing that happened, in my opinion, is it wasn't sold. I don't support selling it, never will. Now with that said, Mike, I agree with you on this point that you made. We will never be able to accommodate the demand for boat parking today five years from now, 20 years from now. Whether we add 50 spaces, have 100 spaces, or 200 spaces, we're never going to be able to meet the demand. It's always going to be there. More than what we can accommodate. Now with that said, I'm a little confused with where this discussion is going because I thought it was brought forward originally simply just to spruce the place up a little bit. Not long-term talks as to what we were actually going to do with the AOB. I think something like that needs to include the general public extensively. And that is also why nothing has been done. But I think we can get a good start by saying we will lease the property or make a park out of it, but it won't be sold. But that is a big discussion, and I am not ready to start committing to what is actually going to be the AOB site for the long term. So it goes back to the idea I thought that Vice Mayor brought up, which was to spruce it up a little bit. And then I had option A and I had option B, which was brought forward. So my answer to that is, staff, I have no costs associated with that in my report. So my first question is to spruce the place up a little bit until we figured out what we were actually going to do with the property long term. I can't answer any that question for Vice Mayor until I know what the costs are. So I am in. I can't move forward any further than what we are today until I know those costs. I do have a concern if it is going to be a lot of costs because we have a uh, heavily used dock at Buena Vista Park that is now shut down. We have a dock on North Beach that I have heard a lot of residents would like it rebuilt. We have a dock at Rocco Park and I'm now getting reached out to by a lot of people in that area that said, what happened to this beautiful dock? When are you going to fix it? Times don't get, here, here's the irony. Our budget is limited. And it, times don't get better than this right now. The economy is humming along. It only gets worse. So I understand 
the issue the vice mayor's brought up the north causeway is probably not the best place for all the future boat parking the AO, the the swoop site is the best place to expand because you get arterial roads of 44 and us1 that are used for most of the future expansion of boat parking but i'm not ready to go even close to start discussing what the long-term future use of that property is without serious involvement with the public um and again to be clear i can't I, I can look at option a and option b to spruce the place up a little bit but we have to talk we have to have the costs associated with that thank you mayor okay so along with commissioner colodi's or vice mayor colodi's thoughts um I certainly think that that's a good short-term use of that property to handle some of the problems we're having now. Some of these problems may get better, but realistically, it's only going to get better until populations grow and, and then we're going to have the same issue. But like Commissioner McGurk says, I don't want to put a lot of money into it because I'm one vote. There's 25,000 other votes out there, and they may overwhelmingly say, we don't care about boat trailers, we want to park. And it's their property, it's not my property. So until we have that long-term discussion about where we're going to head with this piece of property and how we're going to manage this piece of property, along with a comprehensive plan of what the parks we do have now and how that fits into it, I can tell you right now, the people on the west side are screaming because they want to park. There's nothing west of Colony Park. And that's where almost a third of your population is now living. So what are we going to do for those people? That's going to come to a head at some point in time. So on a temporary basis, to, to alleviate some of the issues we're having currently now with, with the uh, everybody being pent up and trying to get out and get on the water, I certainly can't support the temporary parking at the AOB site until we make that long-term commitment. The other thing is I've heard is for years I've heard, what about the MDC Center? Can we use some of their property? Uh, we talked about it during the trolley d discussions. We've talked about it about other things. I, I happened to talk to Chad today, and he says, they are in the same boat as everybody else. Their revenues are down. If there's some way that they could use that as a to help offset some of their cost, even on a temporary basis, they're willing to have the conversation with FWC. But they want the city to have be a part of that conversation. So And... To me, that's, that makes common sense because I've heard they won't allow it, but now there's extenuating circumstances. Maybe they would allow it for a short period of time. You know, it would help the MDC expand some of their revenues. Why don't we have that conversation as a group and check that off the box? If they say, absolutely not, that's done, we can take that, that box completely off the table from now until ever. But people have always come back to that saying, oh, what? we could use MDC. Maybe we could park at MDC. Maybe we could use that for vents on Flagler. But until we have that conversation as a group with FWC who actually owns the property, we'll never know. So we need, need to have that conversation sooner than later. And that, that may also help with some of those parking spots that Commissioner Claudia was worried about. So I could support short term. I just don't want to dump a lot of money into it because we don't know what the long term goal is going to be. So temporary lanes out there, temporary parking styles, uh, I'm, I'm certainly, but to put in stormwater and paving and all that, I, I don't think that we have the money. We have projects now that we haven't funded, that we have issues with. You know, we have a, the old Fort Park that's crumbling. You have the Women's Center that's in bad need of repair that we've done nothing with. So we have other projects that have been in the works for a very long time that we need to address before we look at spending a lot of money on something that, may or may not be a temporary or short-term problem. That's my thoughts. Okay. All right. Um, so I've got a few thoughts as well, and then we'll uh, kick it back, I think, to Mr. Colodi, see where he wants to take this. So first of all, one reason, well, let me touch on a few things Commissioner Hartman just said. Um, I don't disagree. We need that long-term vision. But we've been saying that for two years. And it's great to want the input of 26,000 people, but unless we put it on a ballot, and even then you're only going to get 12,236 people to reply the last time we tried that. Um, but 
we can we can host the we can try to host the I mean we're having charter review committees. We're changing the constitution of how we run the city, and we have the same 15 people show up at those meetings. It's not going to be very much different if we hold these public meetings, but I'm certainly willing to try. I just say we got to do it. We, we can't just keep talking about it. We got to do it. And then say so we've, as you said, check that box that, look, we tried. And if now you want to come up and say you wished you had a chance to have an input, like we held the meeting, it was at the Brandon Center, it was this date, and it was you know, should have been standing room only, but it was the same 15 people. I can't help that. And then we have to make a decision. So um, one thing that I think scared, if I could use that term, many folks on the AOB site is that it was nearly sold. And I don't think that was what a lot of people wanted uh, for that site to, to lose control of. And you heard tonight even many citizens speak to that same thing. Um, I don't want to go into a whole different debate, but I mentioned the charter review, and I, I have some things that I'm hoping we can weave into that. There's there's language that's been inserted that I'm I'm hoping we can craft in such a way that we can we can designate a few landmark pieces of property that would require voter approval to sell, and this certainly I think would make that list if if we can get there and if that's approved by the voters. And I know I just said a lot of ifs, um, but. If, if that could happen, then it kind of takes the sense of urgency on, hey, if we don't do something, this could possibly get sold out from underneath us by some future commission. Um, so that would be a great thing for me to, to know, is that, look, it's going to be ours unless the, the public votes it away. So then the choice before us you know, tonight or the next the near future is, do we do nothing? Do we formalize parking? It's not necessarily an increase. It's actually a decrease from the 263 to something in the neighborhood of 95 or 100. So it's a you know over 50% decrease of parking, but it's formalized, we'll call it parking, or, or create a park. And I haven't heard up here at least really, I think a lot of you are on the same page that I was on of, you know, I, we've never had to write a ticket because our parks were too full and we had too many people just trying to get in our parks. Like it's just never happened. Um, I. I I've talked to thousands of residents. I've had hundreds and thousands, or not hundreds and thousands. I've had thousands of people email me, it feels like, um, just over the course of the time I've been elected. And never once has someone brought up that we don't have enough parks. Now, you're saying folks on the west side may, may be. I haven't gotten those yet. But you know, I don't have data to show it. But anecdotally, I think, I don't know that we're, we're, we're suffering for net new park acreage. I don't think we need net new park acreage. So to me, if we're going to spend money on a park, I'd rather look at some of our existing parks and upgrade and enhance those. If we want to add an amenity like a splash pad, let's add it somewhere where we have existing park space. And I'm not advocating for that. I'm saying if we're going to do it, just make the ones we have better because that's just a, a better thing. The one speaker said it today, you can throw a rock from, from this site and hit two other parks. Uh, and so to just have it facing a different direction with a little slightly different view, I don't think is enough to, to justify that investment of whole park infrastructure. Um, so what do we do with this site? So what are my thoughts? Um, you know, we talk about protecting residents, and Vice Mayor, your, your comments were, were well made that you know, our residents currently have to deal with the over, overflow impacts. I was at that site on Sunday. I was actually with, uh, I rode along with one of our officers on Sunday. And we sat at that site for a while, saw Chief there, and um, it was interesting to see. One thing I observed was there was one particular truck that we, we watched while we sat there for five, ten minutes, and they were just circling. They went into Quaya CC and kind of pulled around, and then we saw them come back by, and then I saw them coming across. The, uh, they were just trolling the whole area, just looking for somewhere to put their truck and trailer. Or they were just waiting for, I think, maybe, maybe our two vehicles to pull off so they could park wherever they wanted. So, uh, you know, that impacts the, the permanent residents. You know, not having a solution to this problem, yes, these are, these are you know, that, that boat trailer may have been from Orlando, but it's impacting the current residents by not having a solution to it. And by adding a park there, or even reducing the current parking capacity, I'm, I'm worried that that may lend to more of a problem. So here's a couple of things I wanted to throw out, and some of the speakers mentioned it today, but um, you know, we've got the property across the street. Uh, we're sitting there. I've got a full boat, boat lot behind me. I've got a guy trolling for parking, and I'm staring at a few thousand square feet of blacktop, already paved. It's, it's sitting there empty. 
why? Why, why couldn't we possibly work out a deal to lease that, charge enough for it that that doesn't cost me as a citizen any money, but it gives us more, more boat parking? So the Marine Discovery Center, another great option. That the, the one trailer I mentioned, I know they drove by that property, so they could pull right in there and park. If we could sell parking location, uh, if we could sell parking at those locations to help cover those costs. Um, I also think, and nobody else has mentioned it, so I'll go out on the limb, you know, we, we have a, sh I'm told that we, we don't have enough marina space. Our current marina is, you know, more than full. I think we're on a waiting list. If I recall correctly from the mooring field discussion, uh, the marina is not a drain on city resources that actually um, manages to break even. So, you know, does that necessarily solve a parking problem? Maybe not, but marinas are not eyesores. The marinas are very attractive in for too many people. So I think that would be another thing that should be talked about in that spot is, you know, should it be an expansion of city marina resources? Uh, and then the last thing I would just point out is, again, trying to get back to this, what is the real problem we're trying to solve? And that is that we just have boats kind of everywhere. Um, one thing I observed, we're sitting there and I got this one truck already trolling for parking. Other trucks are doing the same thing. And meanwhile, there's boats pulling in and starting to unload. They have no clue that there's nowhere to put their boat and trailer once they get their boat in the water. Like, we're not stopping the problem there. It's just continuing to pile up. So now I've just got more people that are going to be trolling the neighborhood. So, you know, you mentioned this isn't a, a you know, every day, all day, a year problem. This is a pretty, you know, finite problem. So another suggestion would be what if we were able to, during peak times, if we were able to staff that facility and say, listen, you know, I mean, just like Smyrna Dunes Park, they got to a point where they said, look, we're closed. It's one in, one out. We, one more car leaves, you can put one more in. What if we got to the same point? We said, listen, we got 200 spots we can put people, and they're all full. So until a boat pulls out, you got you to gotta keep moving. You, there's no, you can't put in. So we, we solved the problem on the front end. So um, I've thrown out a lot of options. I agree with most of what everyone else has said. I, you know, I think there are things we could do really, really quickly to maybe alleviate some of the short-term pain points. And we're going to talk about on the next thing about some of the fines. I think we can do some some things there. Um, and then have some longer strategic discussions. But I'd like to have that, you know, I don't want to be saying that two years from now. So, Commissioner McGurk, and then I'll come back to you. He raised his hand first. So I just want to clarify this discussion. This discussion started to, I believe, Vice Mayor wanting to spruce up the area. Rego to my point, if we have 50, 100, or 200 parking spaces there, it doesn't matter. We still have the same problem. That doesn't solve the problem of everybody looking for a space. That's only going to be solved by enforcement and coming up with, you know, other cities have dealt with this before us. South Florida, West Palm, Jupiter. So I just want to make sure what we're talking about. Are we talking about sprucing this up? Or are we trying to, uh, are we just simply get, you know, whether we have 50 parking spaces on this site or 150, we're still going to have the same problem, which leads to what you were saying about maybe enforcement during peak times. Maybe we don't let people drop their boats before they're able to find a parking space. And enforcement is we have a finite number of parking spaces. Once that's full, that's full. You can't drop the boat. So, again, this conversation has gone off in about three different directions. Yeah. Future use of the site, bar boat ramp parking problems and overflow into the neighborhoods, and then sprucing the place up for the looks. Not only one necessarily has anything to do with the other, so I'm just trying to clarify what exactly is the vice mayor's goal to accomplish today is I believe it was brought up to spruce up the site. And great idea in terms of, you know, dealing with staffing and maybe not letting people drop boats until there's a parking spot. I, 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 that we're, and, and the hundred dollar fines, if we pass them, may do a, go a long way for uh, preventing people from going into the neighborhoods. Because I think the primary goal would be to protect the neighborhoods, then maybe spruce up the site in, in some kind of priority order. Yeah. Well, you've heard, you've heard all the comments, so no. Perhaps I didn't make myself clear. <laughs> I don't remember ever in the beginning of my discussion mention I was asking for any money to be spent on solving this problem. I want ideas. Commissioner McGurk, 
you might not remember that last year we authorized fifty thousand dollars to improve the appearance of the site and make it better along the waterway we haven't even spent all that yet we have put in some picnic tables we haven't repaved a little bit of parking lot but we've we've taken some steps in that the commissioners Hartman and McGurk you've both been here four years at least this discussion has been going on since long before that. It goes back when we were going to lease the property. I was involved in that discussion even though I wasn't on the planning board, I wasn't on the committee, excuse me, the commission. And I've heard nothing about how to move it along and make it better. Nothing. We've gone absolutely nowhere. This is not the first time I brought this up. What I'm looking for is this committee or commission to have some direction as to what to do. I don't want an extra $10 spent right now on trying to figure out how to develop this. I want some positive ideas. I heard positive ideas from the mayor. I have more positive ideas. Yes, Marine Discovery Center, I've talked to them at Marine Discovery Center. To park boats there, the distance is too great to get somebody back to the site to retrieve their boat. You'd have boats all over the place waiting to unload. You would have to set up a program where you have a golf cart to bring them back and forth. But that's an idea. Monitoring the people before they go into the water to see if they've paid or whether they're a fine resident. Yes, that's a great idea. Can't do that with the parking uh, enforcers we have. Because they don't carry that ability with them. Only police do to see where, where somebody comes from. When we decided to try to make find uh, occupants, the main people who come, we had no way to enforce that. It was an idea. As, as the mayor said, let's make it so only local people can do it. It's a great idea. We love that. But we can't enforce something like that. It's a public facility. They get to pay a fee and go in. If they're fined, they register, they go there. We need some ideas. Something else the mayor brought up uh, about a year and a half ago was electronic signage out on, uh, on 44, both before and after Route 95. The racetrack gas station. We have an easement there that was dedicated for our use to put in a message sign. We haven't done anything with it. I know the state is going to be uh, working on the signalization. Perhaps something could be added into that so that when the county is going to close the beach, they change the sign. When we feel there's not enough parking, we change the sign. When the boat ramp's getting full, change it. Yes, there are ideas, but we have to have them. I haven't heard them tonight except from the mayor. I really want to get this moving along. It won't be this year. It won't be next year. But we've got to have a plan and we've got to work towards it. We don't have the money to do the work right now. Yes, we weren't going to apply for any more fine grants. Yet, we're applying for a $600,000 one to repair a pier. I agreed with it. But to uh, have such a position that we won't apply to get money to improve this, I don't agree with that. We can apply for a fine grant. I don't even want these extra boat parking spaces paved. I want them to be grass because they're not going to be used for the majority of the time. I want us to move along. I don't want us to do nothing except talk about it with no ideas. Mr. Mayor, okay. you provide us nice direction. <laughs> Take some. <laughs> Okay, so I appreciate the clarification because I, I certainly, uh, you know, I, I thought your objective was to drive one of those two proposals that you had put together. Um, so I, I appreciate that clarity. So, um, you know, where I think we could go today, what I heard some some consensus around would be you know, clearly we have to have this conversation. We, we want to make sure it's done in the public, etc. You know, my question is, 
is there, and we're going to talk about fines in our next thing, but is there support for, to me, if we go into that, one thing an old boss taught me is if you go into, you know, in, any size group of people and you just say, what do you think? You're never going to get anywhere. You're going to have way too many things out there. So to me, I think the approach would be we come in with a few well-codified, here's option A, B, C, D, here's the potential things we think it's going to solve, and then we put that forward to the community. And I think we, if we do that and do it right and we engage Phil and the team, we can get good engagement on social media, and we can get some direction from those 26,000 people. But those have to be fully baked, and the staff did a fantastic job on the morning field where they were able to come in with a fully baked it takes some time up front. It takes a, a, some investment up front. We come in with a fully baked business proposal as if we were proposing this to shareholders and say, here's the cost, here's our potential return, here's the potential uh, you know, investment up front, um, and, and here's the problem we think it solves, and here's the problems we think it may create. And, uh, and then we, you know, we vet those three or four ideas, and, and maybe there's pieces of them that you know, are, are common to, to all of them. So... Um, you know, if, if that's what we're looking to kind of ideate this, um, then I don't think we're going to necessarily solve that tonight. I think we can take action on the next agenda item, so Resolution 4719. Um, but I think we can say, you know, I don't know, I hate to just schedule another workshop. And I'm, I'm going to come around everybody real quick. But I'd say we commit to a workshop that happens. June is completely booked. So we're, we're booking, and then July's out. So we're booking into August. But I'd say we commit to something in August and, and commit to an outcome of that is we're going to have not just talked through and came up with 100 ideas, but committed and decided to something. And then hopefully by then we'll also have a good sense of where the charter review you know, process is going. Because, again, I think some of this is linked, that if we could designate that as a property that can't necessarily just be sold by any future commission, that takes a weight off my shoulders. You expressed some of the same concerns if you don't want to see the property sold. So, again, that's a whole different debate. So that's where I could see us going on this. I think some of these things we might could act on, but it's taking staff. I mean, we do need to go have that conversation with MDC. We need to talk to the bank across the street, kind of like we've done with the parking on Flagler. we got to go put in a little bit of legwork and say, you know, here are the options and here's truly what they would cost, and then we can get the people involved in that. Um, and by the people, I mean the general public, and of course, of course, each of us. So um, it's kind of where I'm at, hearing the, the well, everything that you just said. So I'll come back around real quick for just brief comments on this, on this, and uh, anything to add to that potential approach. I'm concerned about the no. We have a lot of workshops, a lot of meetings set yeah. up, and I know August seems like a far. <laughs> a long way away, uh, oh, yeah. but the workshops that we're having now could possibly lead to other workshops. Yep. We have the we got a lot on our table, and I think that this conversation has changed from, at least from my understanding, when Vice Mayor brought it up originally, has dovetailed into what is the future goal of the site, which I think certainly um, tenfold makes this. A much bigger issue. I'm fine with the workshop. I think that we need to have some discussions about the AOB site. It's kind of been hanging out there since the last proposal didn't go through. So I'm with you, but I think August may be a tight fit. That's my okay. You, you know, and I mean, look, this is we're in the. We're in politics, so I'll just say it. You know, this is also we're coming up on election, and so there's a part of me that says if we don't start this conversation to August, September, you know, it, it's wrapping up October, November, and then, you know, let's say you have some changing of the guard, which is you know always a possibility. Then, you know, how far back does that set the team? You know, the the team of the city, the city staff. You know, are we starting all the way back at the get go if we're not able to kind of see something through. And that's what a lot of people in the public. I tell you, the one thing I have seen different from private businesses and how they're able to ideate, form, and then execute on strategic planning. One of the key differences from that setting to this one is this notion of you get new leadership in you know every two to four years that potentially that can have a completely different vision, not just wanting to 
iterate on that strategic plan, but come in with a whole different course and direction. And so you end up with doing a lot of this. And so staff is like, hey, yeah, we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll dust off the plan we formed for the you know, the last group that thought that way. So regardless, everybody wants to come and get brought up to speed. Go yeah, to yeah. Side. So to me, it's one of those that, you know, my hope would be this. I think there are things that we could do short term. I saw opportunities short term. I, I think that um, you know, I want to do a deeper dive on the revenue structure and, and make sure I understand exactly, you know, every, you know, how how that revenue structure is set up. Because I tell you what, I saw some boats out there, and those people weren't worried about money. I'll tell you that they had more money in that on their trailer than I'll see in my life. So, you know, I'd love to understand a little better and make sure we understand the revenue structure and what opportunities there are. Because I don't want it to cost our citizens more for people to come visit us and go boating. I want them to pay for that cost and possibly even to give back to our citizens in a way. And, you know, so we can go build a splash park at some other park uh, or pay the maintenance on some other park. So I think there are things we could hopefully do quickly. And then there's this long-term vision that we can put together. You know, I think having the OB side as blacktop would be the worst thing in the world. And I think everybody up here would agree with that. I would hope we could find other space that can accommodate the boat and trailer parking and, you know, work up to whatever that number is. Maybe we say we're going to accommodate 250 spots in this area and then that's it. After that, we're done. If you get, if you're lucky enough to get one of those spots, great. If not, come back tomorrow because if, if, if you don't, you're going to get a massive ticket and a real inconvenience, which we'll talk about in our next thing. So, Mr. Mayor. Yes. I got a question for staff. Colin might remember we had discussed a few trees for that property. We had a tree bank. We, we had a nominal cost for a few trees to spruce up that property. I can see a primitive trail, maybe. I don't know how much it would cost for black top so that an ADA-compliant trail would go through there. And a Florida native landscape, which costs nothing, requires no irrigation. And I'm not, a, I'm not up here, gentlemen, to hear myself speak. So I guess it usually works out like that. But what I said was pretty much what Vice Mayor Colodi said. This is an open area, a few more parking spots for boats. If Jason, Commissioner McGurk, doesn't want to sell the land, or he does want to sell the land, or he doesn't know what he wants to do with it, we'll leave it fallow, but put a couple of trees on it. It doesn't seem like you want to, you're not committed to a park. So, am I right? The only thing I'm committed to is not selling the property at this point. Okay, again, we can do this. Let's stop talking about it and just do it. Provide a few extra spots for trailers, see how that works out, and open up the land. Put a couple of park benches on there, picnic tables, a chicky hut, and so, we're done. So for clarity, when you, when you say, because I've heard both, both of you say this now, and I just want to make sure I understand. When you say provide a few extra spaces, so right now, I mean, I saw it sa Sunday, there was at least 200, I didn't count them, but there's at least this many, if not more. So when you say provide a few extra spaces, it, are you saying from what's there now, I mean, are we paving those? Are we putting gravel? And then what are we, is, are you blocking off the rest? Because then that's a net less space than we have currently. So I... I agree with the trees. If we got a tree bank, I mean, when developers take down trees, they got to give us more trees, and so we can plant them there. I got no issues with that. That seems great. But when you say put a few new parking spaces, what do you what do you mean? If Vice Mayor Colodi said fifty spots, I'd be interested in hearing something a bit less. Uh, again, we got a sign shop. We can write a make a closed sign, okay, that says we're full. Again, I saw. Vehicles with their trailers parked underneath signs that said no parking for boats, trailers, trucks. Okay, it was out of control. This is our park, our city's park. Let's take control of it. Let's do something with it for the people. My gosh, how hard is it? Okay. I'm passionate about it, right? <laughs> Anything that? I think short term we need to increase the available parking spots on the property. Um, I'm all for the workshop and have no problem with that. When I was elected to office, the property was sold. And through the first two years, it was 
under contract. So, you know, that's kind of where that all rolled into. Like you said, come November, could have three different more people up here, and they take a different direction. But I certainly think that we should have short-term short-term solutions, and then long-term, what are we going to do with the property? What's its best use for the citizens? And then work towards those goals. Additional um, property for off-site parking. Like you said, I didn't know that property was available. Um, if the MDC can be Everything a part of that, that's fine. They may opt not. If they get approval, you know, it, things turn around, they may not have the ability to park vehicles there, you know, six months from now. So, you know, but I think that's a short-term solution. So I'm sure I'm certainly looking for short-term problems now to get people off of the roadways and out of neighborhoods. And then anytime you want to sit down and talk about long-term, I have lots of ideas for that place. I think the Marine Discovery Center could make a fortune doing valet service. Put your boat in the water, we take it from there. You jump on your boat, we go park it. I'm telling you, they could make a fortune. I think Jason's kids could make a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a comment? Yeah, we, have, we have approached uh, MDC. This is way back. Um, and at the time, because it's owned by the state and the foundation, yeah. so they said we, we cannot do that. This is when we were talking about the shuttle. Uh, and at some point back in 2004, we even thought about having a ramp at that site. And so the, the residents on Kuwait City found out, and then they came to the commission, and that idea was done. So this was is that before, you? <laughs> before <laughs> Vice uh, Mayor <laughs> moved. I, um, I wasn't opposed to that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, by 120. So like we, we have not, but maybe now because of the, the, the COVID-19 and the loss in revenues, they probably start looking at some other ideas, but uh, I'll, I'll reach out to Chad. Okay. So uh, I'd like to, we got to move on from this. So is, is there any action that, I haven't heard any solid concrete action that we can take tonight. I've heard some people agree we should take action, but not necessarily any concrete action we can take tonight. Uh, I keep hearing that we want to increase parking spaces, but I th which I'm fine with saying that. I think we need to be clear, though, that we're actually, right now you established there's capacity for 263, and what I think I'm hearing is that we reduce that to about 95 and take the rest of it and, and leave that blocked off for non-boat parking purposes. So I just want to be clear that if we say, if that's what we're talking, that's different than trying to add spaces. So, My final comments. There was 263 trailers out there with vehicles attached. There was also another 100 cars parked out there by people who went on the boats also. There's no way we're going to solve that problem. I would like the commission at this point, being we're kicking the can down the road as it is till at least August and maybe the next election and maybe the one after that, uh, to uh, encourage our staff to strictly enforce the parking if it involves overtime, bringing uh, police in from other towns. I would like to have our commission support that. I don't want to hear the commissioners or the public three months from now say, uh, gee, you spent a lot of money out there. So I... I I would like to take that responsibility on myself, that we continue with the strict enforcement, not only here, but in North Beach, and we'll get to that later. Uh, so at least have some support for that being, I, I can't get anybody, I shouldn't say this, but uh, I'll leave that alone. That's what I would like. Uh, I myself plan to go to the uh, county as an individual asking them to provide some positive support for us in providing some additional parking off street different subject i'll get to that later yeah so that's what I, that's what i would like to see i would like to know if there's any uh commissioners that are opposed to strict enforcement let me say that
No opposition. Court strict enforcement. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, do, do I have support for asking staff to work with us on um, putting together some some concrete options? You've heard the, the sentiment, at least, of this commission. You've heard some of the feedback from the public. Um, can we, I think we should commit to starting to ideate and come up with three or four, you know, here's what this could be, and, and let's have those, you know, let's have those public workshops. And there's always a little bit of a chicken and egg with that because it becomes, do we talk about it first and then go to the public? Or do we let the public talk about it first and then comes to us? The problem with that is we take a lot of heat because we get told, well, that's the dumbest idea. Why would anybody, why are you proposing that? And it's like, I, I haven't even chimed in on that yet. Um, so, but you go the other way and it's like, well, why haven't you let us speak first before you're even debating it? And it's like, well, we're going to. We just wanted to try to you know, get it in, in this thing. So however we approach that, I think we should have staff work with each of us and then work independently to come up with some solid concrete options around the AOB site and say, here's option A, B, C, D, general public, what do you, what would you like to do? And that'll happen sometime in the August, September timeframe. And then we'll let the rest of that play out from a election standpoint as it plays out. Thoughts? But Mayor, I think yeah. without having the parameters on to do these options, I think one of the options that we've done last time, which had probably about maybe 40 or 50 uh, trailer parking spaces, and then the rest of it was, I guess, turned into a public space. Um, so that's basically almost of what, what Mike was, was talking about at the time. But if you don't have parameters for the staff, yeah. it's going to be difficult for us to develop any type of plan, uh, not knowing exactly what, what you're looking for. I mean, are you looking for just 50 trailer parking spaces or more? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. So I, mean, I can tell you mine, and then we can, we can either each do that, or we can each do that, just each meet with staff and kind of give our, our thoughts. Mine is... That's work, that works for this site, but only if it's paired with some other solution somewhere else. Like, I don't think we do that. I can't go from 363 people parking over there to, to 90. I mean, I just, I can't, I don't think we can do that. I don't think, that to me, unless we're pairing it with some other solution and saying we're going to provide for that over here, or at least for 80% of that over here. So um, that's, that's where I'm at on that. I don't. I don't want to pave the whole thing and create all 300 spots there. I'd say just leave it as it is for now until we just fix that. A side note, just and I don't think it's going to make a big difference. But if you recall on the swoop, uh, we had phase one, two, three, and four. Phase three was uh, where the maintenance, uh, the fleet maintenance facility. That's probably about maybe 24 spaces, and then the county uh, artificial reef yeah. storage. I mean, that's probably another 54, but. It doesn't look like the county is moving out of that site any soon. So, yeah. And then at some point, they, they talked to us. This is before the county manager, uh, I guess, moved on. Uh, they were talking about if we give them that site permanently for the artificial reef, that they would help us to find within that area another parking for, for a swoop. So, so now I have probably three options. Is one to work with the county on that on that one talk to the MDC, and then talk to the property owner on the North Causeway for a leasing option. So. Yeah, and the county is storing concrete on prime, prime waterfront property that we could be using for parking. So it's fascinating. All right. Are you happy? No. <laughs> How did it make sense? I'm not happy, but... Uh, at this point, I know staff has, has been working on this. They do have concept plans. Concept A, I think, is very good, and I would like to see the commissioners take a serious look at concept A, which basically involves no new paving. Okay. Commissioner Allen. That's what I was just going to say. So. Okay. All right. So... Just so we're clear, what I think we're leaving tonight with on this item is um, staff's going to come up with some, I mean, because to Commissioner McGurk's point, like it, you're saying it's no new paving. I mean, is it, 
it looked like new paving to me on that drawing. So I just I have more questions than answers at this point. So that's where I think we need staff to help us understand better, and then we can bring that back hopefully early August. And yes, we've got a lot, and we got the homeless workshop, we got strategic plan. You know, we got a lot, but you know, and we lost a month and a half of business, frankly. So um, we'll make up for it. Well, I think the temporary s s parking they could do now. I mean, that's just simply putting up some ropes or strings and cones or something for them to open that area up, right? No. Okay. 80% of the area is now wide open mm -hmm. for parking. They park at will. Right. In fact, the one time I was out there, there was 37 boat trailers with one narrow exit out, and somebody parked their boat trailer in it, which leads to all kinds of problems, boats on the water, so on and so forth. There's one area during our previously approved discussions is we moved the white fence or we extended the white fence and we said no trailer parking past it, which works out most of the time, except they park trailers in there also. So there's nothing we can do right now other than strict enforcement. Okay. What my goal is to give the staff direction, such as 53 parking stalls, not pave the whole thing, take a reasonable approach at it. That's what I want. But I just want to do it. Okay. So, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you where I'm at is, I mean, you've heard my thoughts. I'm all for let's do something. I just think the something is still not clear enough that we can we can take action on it. So I just, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to staff a lot and share my thoughts and ideas and they've heard from everybody else and I'll be pushing to get something back in front of us by August that we can bring to the public and say, here's, here's hopefully a comprehensive plan. So, and in the meantime, we'll talk about enforcement, I think, on this next item B. All right, everybody good on item A? Any other comments? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to item B. Resolution 47-19. We have a clerk report. No, I'm sorry, staff. Which one is this one? It doesn't say which one this is. I think is the, um, the target review. review. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, I keep talking about that one. I, I knew I was wrong. Thought about the ordinance later. There's the fees. So, sorry. Okay, item B. Discussion re resolution 4719, Kelly. Yes, it was. I can actually cover that. You want me to just cover this one? Sure. Yeah. So. Uh, this is the so the charter review committee. The original ordinance had them going through um, the resolution, rather had them going through September first, twenty twenty. I had a discussion trying to prep for our joint meeting. I wanted to talk to that facilitator and just you know, hey, how do these work? What have you seen before? And one item she mentioned. So this didn't come from me, but she mentioned was that it, it usually what cities do is they once. After that meeting, where the Charter Review Committee has kind of handed off their work to the to the City Commission, and it becomes our time to start talking and debating and figuring out how we're going to approach this, what we really want, to me, the, the, the most uh, beneficial thing those members can do for us at that point is help to get the word out into the community on the work that they did. And so she said what normally a community would do is you release them from being on the charter review so that they're no longer bound by sunshine. So if you have two of the members that happen to be at some event and they want to talk about this or talk to other members of the, you know, you know let's say the, the, the Chamber of Commerce event and they want to have a discussion sitting at a table between now and the election or now in September, they're not having to worry about that. So I, I don't really care either way. That was just what the charter review facilitator suggested. So I asked Clerk to add it to this so that we could talk about it. If that makes folks uncomfortable, if the Charter, we can even wait and talk to the Charter Review Committee about it. If they want to wait and go and, you know, be until September 1st, I don't think they'll be meeting anymore as a Charter Review Committee. I think once they've handed it off to us, I don't think they're going to be having any more meetings. It's really just us. So that's kind of where this, this came from. So what's before you tonight is do we want to amend that resolution to bring that um, or to, tonight is do we want to direct staff to bring us back an amended resolution at our next meeting that would shorten that and basically sunset the charter review committee so 
that's that's why this is in front of us and I'll open the floor for discussion and again I, I could go either way just bringing it forward with what was told to me comments concerns either way all right I don't see the I mean, import. And, and a part of me says we can maybe even wait and ask the charter review at our joint meeting. It just means that we got to wait to do this for one more meeting. So, other thoughts? I guess we could also go ahead and do this, ask them, and then not approve this if it comes. I mean, if they say no, we want to stay at committee until September, we could just not approve this when it comes forward. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Are we constrained by time? Shortening it to June because of the language for a referendum? I don't follow. Do we have to cut it off at June for any reason? Or can no, we go this is what I just explained. We can go till September, still meet the cutoff to create language to put it as a, on a referendum. So, for, so we have to, the city has to submit the ballot language by, clerk remind me, when was that? So August 18th, we have to submit the ballot language. So we have to have all of our discussion and, and be finalized with what we want to submit on the ballot as a commission, as a city. We have to have that done by August 18th. So if they're wanting to meet all the way through August 18th, we need, that's, like, we, they have to get finished, and I think they are, so that we can talk. Mr. Mayor, I will have an opinion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> recently formed. <laughs> You're very recently <laughs> Uh, I think we should change it because uh, basically the bottom line is it will eliminate the possibility that they could uh, inadvertently commit a uh, joining of the two people. A sunshine together. violation, yeah. Sunshine, that's, that's the word I was looking for. So I would support changing that. Okay. I'd be opposed to it because at one of their meetings they wanted to extend their committee indefinitely and be a standing committee. So why would you abolish them and then reestablish them as a standing committee? You know, I, I, we meet on Friday, Thursday, Friday, Thursday, Thursday. Thursday. So we're meeting Thursday. So, um, we certainly can, yeah. at that point in time, say, yeah, the majority of them want to end, and say, okay, we'll end, end, and do it within the next two week and a half, can't we? I mean, we can have it published by then. Yep. I mean, it's a, it would be a fairly simple thing, I would assume. Yes, that can be handled quickly. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I would be pushes. against it, but I certainly would rather have it come from them than okay. from me. Doesn't bother me. So, so good to everybody? I'd like to let them We'll decide. wait and hear from them. A question, I, Mr. Mayor. Yes. For uh, Commissioner Hartman. Uh, did you, Commissioner Hartman, did you uh, glean from their conversations that they had a consensus to extend that body to an indefinite time later on down? <laughs> One of the recommendations is that they um, review it, I believe it's every four years, it's either four or five years, and there was at least one member, possibly more, talking about staying on all the time. They, didn't but, vote. they did not vote on it, no. though. Well, that's not something they can establish, just for the record. I mean, that's something we, we established they, that committee. They can give a recommendation. Right. They can request, yes. Do you have a comment? Oh. No, I was just clarifying five years. Okay. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Why are you asking it? Oh, it was the five. I get it. I, I get it now. All right. Uh, okay, so we'll we'll wait and have them. So basically, then, we would have to give you that direction at the June 9th meeting, and then... Because we can't do it at the workshop. You can't so, do it at the workshop. So uh, be the I, if it's meeting. very evident at the workshop, I can on my own initiative draft something and have it ready. But okay. otherwise, if it's not clear, we'll we'll talk about it on June 9th. Okay. Want a motion? I don't think we can just. Okay. Does it? It's just a discussion. All right. Um. The facilitator had some comments on them coming staying on too which we'll talk about Thursday all right item 8a second reading would vacate an access easement on private property city attorney read the ordinance a second time by title only ordinance number 2220 
an ordinance of the City of New Smyrna Beach vacating a public access easement on private property located on Claremont Street and Fremont Street, providing for conflicting ordinances and providing an effective date. Uh, all right, uh, Brian or Bob, report. Uh, Brian. Just a brief report. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, this is a request of vacation for approximately 25 foot wide by 250 foot long public access easement that's located on the applicant's property. It's it's connects Claremont Street and Fremont Street. Um, after much review, staff determined that the public access easement requested for vacation was granted to the city as a condition of approval of a previous Fremont Street right-of-way vacation years ago and thus vacating it would create a dead-end street. Staff pointed this out to the applicant who then expressed the desire to relocate the easement as opposed to just vacate it. Um, staff indicated we were open to this um, as long as the easement met public access standards and would be acceptable to the surrounding property owners. The applicant was not able to find an acceptable location to relocate the easement and in written correspondence received yesterday, the applicant stated he does not intend to further pursue this matter. Staff therefore recommends the city commission deny the proposed public easement vacation. Okay. So public hearings, anyone in the public wish to speak on this? Seeing none. Is there a motion to adopt ordinance 2220? And for clarity, you always make motions in the affirmative. So there'll no be a move, motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Sharon, if you would call. Uh, any discussion from the commission on this? I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> uh, one comment I did want to make just for uh, the sake of the public. Every time these come up, I, I usually get at least one or two emails about, you know, why are we giving away public land? So I asked Carrie about it. And the, the, the nuance here is in, in right-of-ways uh, or, or access easements, these are land. Thank you, Kelly. These are lands that were basically given to us, if you will. It's not land that we went out and bought and owned. This is lands that we had access to via our position as a city. And we're just saying, yeah, we don't, we don't necessarily need that anymore. So um, it's a little different than giving away public land. So we can have that debate at some other time. We had a motion in a second. Sharon, if you would call the roll. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Commissioner McGurk votes no. Commissioner Sachs? No. Vice Mayor Colodi? No. Commissioner Hartman? No. Mayor Owen? No. Ordinance 22-20 is denied. Thank you, Brian. Ordinance 34-20, second reading, which would propose a zoning text amendment as a special exception in the B3 zoning district. City Attorney, read the ordinance by title only. Ordinance number 3420, an ordinance of the City of New Smyrna Beach amending the land development regulations, amending Article 2 definitions, Section 201, general definitions, to amend the definition of kennel, amending Article 5, zoning district, Section 50402, specific regulations by district, B3, Highway Service Business Zoning District, to add kennels as a special exception, providing for codification, providing for public hearing, providing for conflicting ordinances, and providing an effective date. All right, uh, so, uh, Brian, go ahead. Uh, just a brief overview. I know Mr. Horvath is here and would like to speak. Um, so if this zoning text amendment is approved tonight, the applicant's next step would be to apply for the special exception that this text amendment would create, and that special exception would be desired at the 1301 Canal Street property. So uh, as discussed at first reading, a primary concern is the potential noise impacts to nearby residential areas from barking dogs. And to address this concern, we have the two conditions that are currently in the ordinance, which as a reminder were no kennel could be within 250 feet of any residence. Um, that would be measured from the property line of the kennel to the actual residential structure. And secondly, the outdoor controlled environments shall not be used between the hours of 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. So based on this discussion at first reading, the applicant has stated he could accept a change to require no kennel within 225 feet of any residentially zoned property as measured from the property line of the kennel to the property line of the residentially zoned property. So staff would recommend requiring both of those criteria. The commission wanted to have those, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, some non-residential zoning districts can have residential structures in our code. Uh, for example, the, the 
you know, the B4 zoning district is commercial, allows multifamily. You might have a PUD. Uh, some of the agricultural districts could have a single family residence. So in an abundance of caution, you could apply both of those criteria to this text amendment. Staff feels like the uh, ordinance as currently drafted is sufficient, but if you wanted to add that additional precaution, I would suggest making it additive to the two conditions that are there. Um, as a reminder, the Planning and Zoning Board recommended approval by a 4-3 vote. Um, staff does recommend approval of the ordinance as written, and I'm um, here for any questions, and Mr. Horvath is here as well. All right. Thank you, Brian. And this is a public hearing, so we'll hear from the public at this time if you'd like to like to speak. I'd like to bring to your attention, too, in the folders that I've yep. distributed, there's an email that's from a resident named Debbie Vishnesky. She was unable to be here, okay. but that's what it's in reference to. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. If you would like to speak, you can come on ahead. If you have something to hand out, uh, Kelly will take it from you right over here. And we should read that email into the record since um, we've got an applicant and it's the legislative. Okay. Debbie. All right. Dear City Clerk, I'd like to be on the agenda for the May 26 YouTube online meeting that will discuss allowing overnight boarding of B3 zoning if a certain, if a certain distance from residential property. Parenthetical, the last meeting it was discussed 250 feet. However, further discussion was necessary in order to use the property line versus actual residential building in parenthetical. I'm a resident of NSB and the remaining owner along with Mr. Neal, Mr. Neal's heirs. Of course, we would like to sell the property and have tried to several times in the past 10 years. We have no plans to open a business there as I'm retired and Mr. Neal's heirs do not live in the area. We feel fortunate to have a potential buyer for the properties that we've been trying to sell it for a number of years. Please see attached letter to the mayor and city commissioners. I have not sent them emails individually, so please put a copy of the attachment along with this email in their bin prior to the meeting so they can review it. Let me know if you have any questions or if, you, or if I need to do anything else. Thank you, Debbie. And then there's an entire letter here. I don't, I'm not going to read all this. No, okay. Okay. I, we got the gist of it. It's a long letter. It'll be in the, in the meeting minutes. Uh, I, I gather they support it, though. And it's been a lot of different restaurants, I think, they call out. So. All right, it's a public hearing. Now's your, now's your chance. Just give your name and address, please. Yes, my name is Jennifer Horvath Prococo. I'm at 2925 Hardy Avenue, New Smyrna Beach, Florida, 32168. Uh, my family has lived here for about 15 years and have been property owners for the last nine um, I currently own and operate a successful luxury pet resort in Brighton, Michigan, and desire to open one here in New Smyrna Beach. Obviously, the older we get, the desire to be closer to family is more important, and that's what I'm here for. This high-end resort for pets um, is a considerable need in the New Smyrna Beach area, um, and from the number of people that we've talked to, it's an overwhelming positive response um, with everyone that we've discussed it with. The word kennel has a negative connotation. I know that's the language we're using this evening. And I just want to um, talk about that. That's an old school way of thinking. Um, and the new trend in the pet industry is really a resort style um, that's highly customizable, offers multiple services, one-stop drop, um, easy access, and convenient location. And for the last few years, my family and I have looked for a proper property for um, this business. And we finally found it at the 1301 Canal Street, and that's what brings us here this evening. So the current property zoning is B3, and this allows three out of four of our services. So it currently allows the doggy daycare, the bathing, grooming, and the on-site training. Um, and we could start the business with those three services tomorrow, but really the overnight boarding, overnight lodging is um, a crucial component to a successful business model for this, style, this type of industry. Um, so, therefore, with the guidance from the Planning and Zoning Department, um, we are requesting approval um, to the B3 zoning changes, um, as Brian uh, mentioned, for the property line to property line adjustment and or the um, 250 feet from structure to structure, um, and the operational hours from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, 
And then also just kind of as a note, I know that we've talked to everybody here since our last meeting on the 28th. We did take um, notes on that and we moved forward with some action items from that meeting. And that was we met with all of the commissioners. Thank you very much for taking um, time to meet with us. And we met, met also with um, the vice mayor and, and the mayor himself. Um, and we appreciate all your feedback and hopefully those adjustments and conversations that we've had has um, answered all of your questions and concerns. And um, our door is always open. Um, we also did one crucial component that we did that the mayor asked us as we met with all of the surrounding business owners um, from that 1301 Canal Street property. And we had great meetings with um, owners and or office managers. Um, and I have two letters here today, one from Debbie and Jennifer Pell um, that own Lindley's, and also from Michelle and Shane that own the All Phases Fencing. And both of them are in great support of um, welcoming us to the community um, and look forward to having um, a renovation on that property over there and uh, hope to uh, add some value, value and business to the area. Sure. So we would just appreciate your approval tonight on um, the change in the zoning. Quick question. Did you also talk to some of the residents? Did you talk to one of the residents that were close yes, by? I'm sorry. We did. We talked to, so the resident that we used to make that 225 or 250 um, foot um, criteria, um, Kevin and Lorette, we actually met with Kevin and he was in approval and positive for it as well. The neighbor that was next to him and a little further away, it's in an estate and it's a rental property, so we didn't talk to the renters. Um, but we did talk to the one, the property owner. Um, that's, that's closest. That's the closest, and that we used in the diagram on the previous meeting. Okay. All right. Any other, thank you very much. Any other members of the public wish to speak on this item? All right. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and have discussion by the commission. Any discussion on this item? Yeah, I'd just like to make the comment. I want to thank you for the work that you all put in, reaching out to the neighbors and addressing a lot of the concerns that we had. Appreciate that. Great example of how that should be done. Other comments on this item? <laughs> no, I just have a question for the attorney. Do we have to disclose that we spoke with them? This, this is not a quasi-judicial, yeah. this is legislative. Okay, yeah, so. yeah. yeah. Because I did. Yeah, well, we all did. Um, okay, uh, so if nobody else has anything, I'll, I'll make a, a few comments. Um, and actually, I have a few questions for staff just to kind of put on the record. So uh, I think it's covered in here, but first of all, let me be clear. I think from my discussions with them, they're going to run a, a, a tight operation, and this won't be an issue as long as they are running the facility. But we obviously, we have to plan for the what-ifs and the eventualities. And so my question is, um, you know, what, how, how wide is this aperture being opened and what protections do we have in place if and when eventually they're not running this facility? Um, so what if, you know, things like noise? Like, I think from the work they're going to do, the noise will be kept to a minimum. But there's protections in place, right? If someone wants to come in and have... You know, it's just way too loud. There's there's maximum thresholds and there's enforcement that could be taken at that time. Is that a correct statement? That's correct. Our noise ordinance would apply. Okay. Um, and then I, I also had a question. I just want to be clear on this. Why wouldn't we just do a one-time variance on this property versus going through this whole thing of, of adding it to this B3 zoning district and potentially opening up other properties uh, mm -hmm. to this? Wouldn't be eligible for a variance. A variance is, is a deviation from a current standard. So it would apply to like dimensional items, setbacks, heights, um, square footage. Um, this is a, a change in use. It's adding something in that would be that would require to go through this procedure. Okay. Thank you. And uh, to be clear on that, this isn't a blanket approval for any other location, including even the one we're talking about that it's still going to require further commission approval. And so Correct. even if this one's approved, someone comes in tomorrow for some future place and it's just not the right place, maybe they talk to all those neighbors and they hate it and they're in here protesting, it's a special exception. We can deny it pretty much based on city attorney. It's the criteria for denial would just be, yeah, it just doesn't fit the neighborhood or what, what would be the criteria at that point that us or some future commission would be bound to?
One, it has to be among the list of special exceptions, which this uh, text amendment would do. It would not impair the character of the surrounding or adjoining districts, nor be detrimental to the public health, morals, or welfare. And then there's the adequate utilities, access roads, drainage, sanitation, yeah. or other necessary yeah. services. So you, there is some subject, uh, subjective yeah. criteria. So I, I um, so I'll tell you my. I mean, last meeting was pretty transparent. I was fairly torn on this, and. You know, my concern was, man, does this make right sense to put a, you know, a kennel in a downtown area? After talking with them and talking with the surrounding business owners and actually looking at this from a, um, kind of a different lens, that, real, that area is really not so residential as it is commercial. And I'll tell you, I've dropped a ton of money at Lindley's the past few weekends because I've done some landscaping. And so I've talked to them a few different times. Uh, and... She was the one of the owners told me she was like, L just stop and listen. Like this place is loud. Uh, it's Canal Street. It's always loud anyway. She's like, I don't think we'll hear anything going on over there. So, um, the the you know with the measures that were put in place and the additional criteria that's been suggested with uh, by staff, if if that is added to this motion, um, I could support it. I think it's got the support of that neighborhood. I think it would be an upgrade from a property that we're already starting to get vandalizing calls. There was a break in there a couple weekends ago. Actually, I was at Lindley's and I saw four cop cars in the parking lot of this place. So it's going to become a, a, a nuisance area. It's already a problem property. I think there'll be great business uh, members in our community. And I, I think this is the right thing to do. So with that additional criteria, I could support this. Other comments or do I have a motion on this item? I can get those additional criteria. I'll make that motion. I think you could just make it with the okay. just. Is that is that yeah? I make the motion with additional criteria outlined by staff. Yeah. Second. All right. Any other dis discussion? Go ahead, Vice Mayor. I have concerns about this. It has nothing to do with this particular property. It has to do with the rest of the. Uh, the zone which will now allow it. Uh, it was pointed out there's very few properties that could fit into that. Um, however, properties can be combined so that it, it could end up being a uh, difficult situation. Uh, however, uh, listening to our attorney explain the special conditions and how we have the opportunity to um, look individually at a, at a different application in a different place. Uh, I'm satisfied. I could support it. Okay. All right. I had a motion and a second. If no other discussion, Sharon, if you would call the roll, please. Commissioner Sachs? No. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. Commissioner Hartman? Yes. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. Ordinance number 34-20 with staff suggested amendments and changes to that text is approved. Thank you all. We'll see you for the special exception. <laughs> and truly, thank you for going. I mean, they, they really did put a lot of time into trying to do this right and hear the community and, and the commission, I think. So it really is a, uh, yeah, it's good. Ordinance 50-20, second reading and public hearing would replace the city's impact fee ordinance and approve new rates for road and impact fees. The city attorney will read the ordinance by title only. Ordinance number 5020, an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of New Smyrna Beach, Florida regarding impact fees. Repealing and replacing Chapter 52 of the City Code of Ordinances entitled Impact Fees. Providing general definitions, providing rules of construction and general legislative findings. Providing administrative provisions related to the imposition, collection and use of impact fees providing for exemptions, alternative impact fees, and developer contribution credits, providing for impact fee review hearings and notice requirements governing the adoption of impact fees or increase of impacts, impact fee rates, providing for the review of impact fees and for administrative costs, providing definitions and legislative findings related to road impact fees, providing for the imposition, collection, and use of road impact fees, providing definitions and legislative findings related to fire protection and emergency services impact fees, Providing for the imposition, collection, and use of fire protection and emergency services impact fees. Providing definitions and legislative findings related to parks and recreational facilities impact fees. Providing for the imposition, collection, and use of parks and recreational facilities impact fees. Providing definitions and legislative findings applicable to law enforcement impact fees. 
providing for the imposition, collection, and use of law enforcement impact fees, providing for severability, codification, liberal construction, and providing an effective date. That is the longest title ever. Yes. <laughs> Does it always say that liberal, that there was one phrase in there that was new, right? Uh, yes, so ah. Evan Rosenthal yes. is here. Evan slipped it in, is that what so you're saying? So they're part of the Neighbors Giblin Law Firm. They are the gurus on impact fees, and they drafted this ordinance. And okay. He is here to answer questions. And All right, I just, I don't remember hearing that liberal interpretation line. It's a neighbor's and, thing. Okay. Uh, so did I just have a brief overview. It's shorter than the title of the ordinance. So the, um, um, as, as Carrie mentioned, it's, it's a comprehensive impact fee ordinance that repeals and replaces Chapter 52. Um, it covers police, uh, fire, roads, and parks. Now, the, the only rates being changed by this ordinance are the road impact fees. Uh, an impact fee study is underway for the other three fees. We expect to have that back in August, and then we would bring those rate changes um, to you around that time. Um, the just a couple highlights. Um, you know, payment of the impact fees is due at the time of building permit issuance. Uh, that's that's fairly standard for our industry. That's the way we do it now. Um, impact fees are based on the rates that are in effect at the time the the building permit is issued, not at the time of, of permit submittal. Um, impact fees have to be spent within eight years. Um, that's um, Evan can talk more about that in detail. There's a statutory basis for that. Um, the ordinance adopts new road impact fees um, overall um, if and there's a there's a whole range some of them go up some go down depending on the use if the future development matched our current mixture of uses residential and commercial the total transportation impact fee revenue would increase by 32 percent so some of the rates go up by more than that some actually go down but the, if the mix stayed the same it'd be a 32 percent increase um, it allows for annual adjustments based on the consumer price index. And then um, a final version was sent out today with one very minor correction um, in Section 52.15 that stating that the increased impact fees take effect 90 days after the adoption of the ordinance. Decreases can take effect immediately. Um, so staff does recommend approval. And again, Evan is here to address any questions that you may have. Do decreases have to take effect immediately, or can they go the same 90 days coterminous? They, they could go all at the same time. Um, however, right. the developers probably, really matter, or but. homeowners want to take advantage of it. Okay. All right, this is a public hearing, so any members of the public, you <laughs> wish to speak? No. All right. Um, Evan, thanks for being here. Are there any questions of either staff or the attorney that helped us on this uh, tonight? Not let's do have a motion to adopt one that's fifty dash twenty. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Discussion. Go ahead. So I uh, apologize up front if I'm a little winded, but I wanted to put this in the context. Um, point out a couple of things. Number one, being on a transportation committee, wanted to point out something that's very important about this eight year requirement. A lot of people asked us, well, if you're developing 44, how come we, we collect all this money? How come we don't, um, how come we don't have the money when we need to do it? There's an eight-year statutory requirement, requirement. So the idea, the common sense of the public would be you build up the money from State Row 44 from the impact fees. But you can't do that. We, when it's time to make improvements on a road due to the growth and development of it, the money's not there. I think it's important to point that out because that's an important detail that often gets overlooked. And I know I spoke to Brian about it. It's a state requirement. It's nothing that we can do about it. But when we say there's no money to build roads when they're then congested after 44 develops for 20 years, that is a very significant problem. Um, and I just want to clarify that because it, 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 it common sense says you, you take this money, you build it up, then you spend it when it's needed. But that's not what happens. If you don't use it within eight years, the money goes back to the applicant. That's a flaw in my theory on, in my opinion, on impact fees for cities to be able to retain them, build them up, and then use them when they're needed. The other thing I wanted to point out was the um, 
the ability to when you have to pay the impact fee. And this is, I'm going to bring up two issues that go back to small business. We often talk about small business in this community, how we love small business, how we want to foster small business growth in this community. And yet I have said there's no difference between a small business and a big business in our books. In our, so we often get lost. Well, what does that mean? Well, here's what this means. You have to pay $100,000 to get your site plan approved you want to build any kind of building. You are limited with your cash flow. Typical way of, let's say I'm going to build a 2,000 2, square foot building with a drive through I'm going to, in my case, I'm going to need about $100,000 to get that site plan approved and go through the whole process. I'm going to go to my bank and I'm going to borrow a construction note. That construction note is going to be, let's say, six months over time. As soon as my contractor starts construction, I start paying for work that's being done. The loan is for six months. I don't pay principal for six months. It gets wrapped up in the end. The construction note turns into a regular note. But you start paying interest immediately. So when you look at this impact fee schedule, you're talking tens of thousands or up to seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 that you would have to pay the city up front in impact fees. By the way, there's county impact fees. County impact fees on any building or addition to a building is a lot. So you're easily pushing $100,000 in impact fees for a small business to be able to put in a little business. If you have to pay that up front and you're already cash strapped, then you have to have the cash to pay those interest payments immediately. So I think it's very important that at least small business under a certain scale has the ability to pay that fee out of the construction loan money at the end when you get your certificate of occupancy. Otherwise, you're making it that much more difficult for that small business to be able to build a building. Um, and that's in very important detail because any small business person struggles with finding the money and the cash flow to be able to do this. I also want to point out what, in my opinion, and I talked to Brian about this, there's a, a national standard we go by by putting a value on certain kinds of businesses. I just wanted to point out that a super convenience store gas station, in other words, a Wawa's or, God forbid, a Bucky's, comes in, and those things are massive. They're going to pay 60% less than if somebody wants to put in a 2,000 square foot building with a drive thru. Clearly, we, the highest use here is a building with a drive thru. And I know it's, it's fun to uh, pick on those kinds of businesses. But if you look across the board here at our impact fee schedule, it's completely, in my opinion, out of whack. A shopping center only pays $2,080 per thousand square foot. A restaurant with a drive through is the highest at $15,000 per thousand square foot. A Bucky's or Wawa's comes in and they're only paying $9,500. So regardless of the business that you like or don't like, the idea that a Bucky's can come in and pay less per thousand square foot, 60% less, than a small business drive through to me makes no sense. It's something doesn't add up. I talked to Brian about it, but I wanted to make you aware of this. I wanted to make you aware because obviously I can speak in the context of a small business, small business with a drive through that's the kind of business I'm in. And it just seems way out of kilter to be able to put something like a superstore, super gas station, or a gas or, or an entire shopping complex up, significantly less per square footage impact for transportation impact fee. A pharmacy is only sixteen hundred, so you can put up a Walgreens or a CVS on the corner, and you're going to pay sixteen hundred. So something's not right there. It doesn't feel good to me. I would at least like to be able to put in a provision for small business to be able to be able, you know, how do you do that? The question is, how do you put in a provision for a small business person to be able to at least pay that impact fee at the end before he gets a certificate of occupancy? So there's a lot of problems here and I'm throwing yeah. a lot at you. No, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's good, but good stuff. This, but the important thing is, you know, 
one of the reasons I want to be up here on this dais is to is for small business. It's for the small guy. And we talk about that all the time. We really do want to do well. But this specific thing is where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. It's not some anecdotal issue. If we're going to develop and foster small business and the eclectic kind of businesses we have in town, we have to stop legislating them out by the cost. And that comes with stormwater, class one, class two. We have to, as we make changes to this, to our ordinances and laws, we have to be able to separate small business from big business, from big large scale commercial companies and small business people who come in and put their life savings into a business. Because I can tell you right now, there's probably three or four very popular businesses. I can tell you right now, Go Juice, uh, Mason Bar, um, Florida Local, Island Roasters, at some point, if they ever wanted to get into this build up to a where they're going to put a building and a drive through which is exactly the kind, they may not want to, but that's how you would elevate that next step. You're making it almost financially impossible for them to be able to do it because you're treating them like a big guy. So these are the things I wanted to bring it to your attention. I apologize on second reading. We changed it where we didn't really comment on first reading. And I should have communicated with Brian beforehand. Um, lesson learned. <laughs> but I wanted to bring this up and dump all this issue on, on top of you guys. So I'd at least like, at this point, I, at some point I would like to readdress these. I know these are very important. I know Vice Mayor this is very important to him. And he's very passionate about this issue. Um, so I will move forward with it. Is there a way that, w how would we put a provision in for a, a certificate of occupancy to pay at the impact fee at that time? Sure, an applicant could request that and then we would bring that to the commission and then you could decide whether they could delay that payment until a certificate of occupancy. Our standard and most, you know, um, single family homes, they would follow the at building permit issuance, but if somebody f had had a hardship, they could bring that to you. Um, and then to address the, if somebody felt like the, the, the formulas in here generated a fee that was just unreasonable for what they were actually generating, there is a provision for an alternative impact fee to be applied. They would have to provide information. So, you, you know, that, that can be done. I have seen it done successfully. Yeah, it, but here's what I want to tell you. That response is works well for people who can hire yeah. and use attorneys yeah. and they have money. I'm talking about the person who walks in. They don't know anything about this. They come in dead cold. They know what they do. They sell coffee. They sell yogurt. They sell go juice. They don't know anything about this world. And when they come in, it's like they're smacked in the face by it. And what you're describing takes time and money which is two things they really don't have. So we got to find a way going forward where we can separate somehow, maybe by size. There's got to be a criteria we can create that starts allowing the small business person to be able to operate easier and more fluidly than, than taking time and money to then come before the commission. Because i got to tell you, what I did this process as someone who didn't know and understand any of it. And my head was spinning. And all I did was basically create a really nice parking lot. So when you start fresh and you go into buildings and, you're, and you, you don't even know what you don't know. Carmen but, will teach you. Yes. <laughs> right. That's what her job is. is and that's, to help that's help that's people walk through these processes. Well, um, look, I don't want to throw yeah. a wrench in this. but So... So the pay at the end, basically what I'm hearing you say is that is basically they can request that and this body could approve it. Um, the other, trying to do it by like size of business, obviously all these things are gradiented on, you know, per square foot, right? I mean, so that's your inherent kind of bake-in of a, a Bucky's is going to have a lot more square footage than an Island Roasters, you know, so that's your built-in, but as... I'm guessing there's you can't probably legally add other tiers and say, hey, if you're less than 25 employees or less than 250 million in revenue or 25 million or 2 million in revenue, 
this is your schedule versus that schedule. I'm, I'm, all the attorneys in the room probably just cringe, right? Is that am I, is that an accurate statement that that you just can't go there? You can't tell from Kerry. I, I know I can't I can't read anybody's face at the moment. So this is Evan. Good evening. <laughs> go ahead. Um, as Kerry mentioned, so my name is Evan Rosenthal. I'm with the law firm Neighbors Giblin and Nickerson out of Tallahassee. And it's, uh, it's our privilege to uh, serve as the, the city's outside counsel with respect to the impact fee ordinance. Um, from what you were describing, I mean, it is, it is conceptually possible, I think, to come up with, uh, with a study that incorporated other factors other, other than just square footage. Um, I haven't really seen that, uh, to be frank, but I'm not saying it's not possible. It's also, though, not what is in the study that's currently in front yeah. of the city tonight that was conducted by Duncan Associates. So... Okay. Again, I don't, want to, I don't want to rule out that possibility completely. It's not something that I've really seen in practice, but could it be done? Maybe. Okay. And we can't, if I were, last question, then we can move on, or last that I have at least. We can't get into the picking winners and losers of, somebody can't just come and say, hey, can I appeal and get a reduction of my, of my fee? Like, we can't, this body can't do that, because then... There's no reduction. They can submit an evaluation that we would evaluate and bring to the commission with our recommendation, and then you could vote on that. But that has to be based on some like science, right? Yes. It's right. not just. It's not like a code enforcement reduction. Is what I'm trying to say. We you can't have to go through the process. Yeah. Of a which, to your point, becomes like impossible. I got to go hire this guy again, and he looks expensive. So, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote yes to this tonight. Tonight. Yeah. But what I would ask my commissioners is go back to this schedule. Take a look at it and try to, to try to see how out of kilter these these fees are, and and I'd be more than happy to talk about it at any time about how the process for a small business person as we put in these regulations and increase these fees, we make it almost impossible, and that's why big developments go up on corners called commercial nodes, and then everybody has to try to lease out a little spot in there. Because that's the only thing that's affordable. But you don't get the volume. You don't have a good business model. You don't get the traffic. Yeah. So anyway, there's a lot to it. But I appreciate the commission's time on hearing me on this. And, um, and, and, uh, and I do encourage you to take a look at what I think is um, a, a little an out-of-kilter uh, assessment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We had a motion and a second. Other discussion? Yep. Yes. Oh. I heard him first. I'll come to you, Vice Mayor. Go ahead. So I thought when the county redid their impact fees, theirs was paid at the time of CO. I'm not sure what they arrived at for the time. Some cities and counties do offer to have it at CO. I think it's a little bit more conventional, I'll defer to Evan, to have it at the time of building permit issuance. It's our preference for several reasons. Um, can elaborate if you like, but but he's right. The county. And I know when I built my house, uh, I I paid my impact fees uh, just before the CO. Yeah, okay. I think when they re the one they did last year, year before, the, I thought because because of what was going on in Port Orange, you know, they said, well, you know, it's not paid. We don't actually receive any money until the time that they actually receive the, the CO on the property. So that's when we actually get the impact fees because people were saying, well, why aren't you building the roads ahead of time, you know, and, and so that they're prepared for when these subdivisions build out. And I said, well, we don't get our money until CO. So I was just, you know. Yeah, and, and just to expand on what Brian was saying a little bit, I think in, in general it's more common to see impact fees collected at the building permit stage, which is also the earliest stage you can collect impact fees at by state, by law. That's, that's in the, the Florida Impact Fee Act. There are certainly jurisdictions out there that are doing it at CO as well. I think, you know, as you alluded out there, there's some planning advantages to, to getting it earlier, to getting a building permit. Um, I wouldn't want to go any later than CO, though. Um, right. you know, after, like, that's, if, if they don't pay it at that point, you can obviously withhold the CO. If you, if you start pushing beyond that, you really have no enforcement mechanism other than take them to court, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Before you go, I support this. He supports it. I know you support it. So you're not having to make a case to try to win the support. So it's just in light of the hour. But if you have comments, please, the floor is yours. I understand the concerns, but there is a cost of doing business. And uh, hopefully people do due diligence ahead of time and they realize what are, their fees are going to be. And I do just want to remind the board that it's not just square footage, it's class of construction. 
and, and what the use is and how much traffic it's going to generate. So all those things are taken into account. We started this last year, November. We approved the study that we paid for, and we should just move ahead. If, sure. if, there's, if there's an individual person with some odd individual project, we can address it individually. That's all. All right, we had a motion and a second. Sharon, if you would call the roll, please. Vice Mayor Colodi. Yes. Commissioner Hartman. Yes. Commissioner McGurk. Yes. Commissioner Sex. Yes. Mayor Owen. Yes. All right, thank you. Did you drive down from Tallahassee today? Are you driving back tonight or are you staying here? You were planning to? Oh, you are planning. I'm sorry, man. If I'd have known that, we might get a bump this up. Sorry. Safe travels. All right. The next set of items are related to 1016 Dillon Circle. Uh, there's two second readings and a public hearing. So this is items D, E, F. We're going to go through these together. City Attorney will read these ordinances by title only. Ordinance number 4420, an ordinance, ordinance annexing into the City of New Smyrna Beach 3.3 .3 plus or minus acres of property located on the west side of Dillon Circle between Williams Road and Bay Drive. Addressed as 1016 Dillon Circle, providing for redefining boundaries of the city, designating the property within Commission Zone 3, providing for public hearing, providing for required filings, providing for conflicting ordinances, providing for severability, and providing an effective week. Ordinance number 4520, an ordinance of the City of New Smyrna Beach, amending the comprehensive plan, changing the future land use designation of 3.3 .3 plus or minus acres of land located on the west side of Dillon Circle between Williams Road and Bay Drive. Addressed as 1016 Dillon Circle, from Volusia County Rural to City Rural, providing for amendment of the associated comprehensive plan maps to show the area incorporated into the city, providing for public hearing, providing for conflicting ordinances, and providing an effective date. Ordinance number 4620, an ordinance of the City of New Smyrna Beach, rezoning 3.3 .3 plus or minus acres of property located on the west side of Dillon Circle between Williams Road and Bay Drive, addressed as 1016 Dillon Circle, from Volusia County A3A, Transitional Agriculture, Airport overlay to City A3A, Transitional Agriculture Airport overlay, providing for conflicting ordinances, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Um, any ex parte on this one? Just speak up now. Hearing none, uh, we'll now hear from Mr. Mathan, if you would please uh, be sworn in. Do you, um, do you swear or affirm that the evidence you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Right, if you would state your full legal name, your educational and professional background. My, main, my name is Robert George Mathan, Jr. I have over 28 years in the public sector, with the last 18 years with the city of New Smyrna Beach. I've held the position of a permit technician, a zoning technician, associate planner, and I'm currently the senior planner for the city. Thank you. Does any member of the audience or commission wish to question him on his qualifications? Hearing no objections, uh, he is qualified, he's determined to be an expert in the area of land development, qualified to give opinion testimony concerning these matters. Are you familiar with these ordinances? Yes, sir. Please state whether it's consistent with the comp plan and your recommendation on the property. It is consistent with the comprehensive plan. The staff recommends approval to all three uh, ordinances. Would any member of the commission or the applicant like to question Mr. Mathenow's testimony? Uh, I'll now hear from the applicant. I don't believe they're here. All right. Any members of the public? Seeing none. Um... Do I have um, closing remarks? Anybody got? Oh, all right. Uh, where are we at? All right, we'll now consider. So we got ordinance 44-20. Do I have a motion to adopt ordinance 44-20? So moved. Second. Sharon, if you would call the roll, please. Commissioner Hartman? Yes. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Commissioner Sachs? Yes. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. Uh, ordinance 45-20. Do I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Uh, city uh, Chairman, if you would call the roll, please. Commissioner Hartman? Yes. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Commissioner Sachs? Yes. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. And 46 20, is there a motion to adopt? So moved. City, uh, sorry, Sharon. <laughs> city Sharon. City Sharon. Sharon, if you would call the roll, please. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Commissioner Sachs? Yes. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. Commissioner Hartman? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. All right, the next items up are for 1031 Bay Drive. There's 
two, there's three ordinances here, 47, 48, and 49. City Attorney will read these by title only. Ordinance number 4720, an ordinance annexing into the City of New Smyrna Beach 2.4 plus or minus acres of property located on the north side of Bay Drive between Williams Road and Dillon Circle, addressed as 1031 Bay Drive, providing for redefining boundaries of the city, designating the property within Commission Zone 3, providing for public hearing, providing for required filings, providing for conflicting ordinances, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Ordinance number 4820, an ordinance of the City of New Smyrna Beach amending the comprehensive plan, changing the future land use designation of 2.4 plus or minus acres of land located on the north side of Bay Drive between Williams Road and Dillon Circle, addressed as 1031 Bay Drive from Volusia County Rural to City Rural, providing for amendment of the associated comprehensive plan maps to show the area incorporated into the city, providing for public hearing, providing for conflicting ordinances, and providing an effective date. Ordinance number 4920, an ordinance of the City of New Smyrna Beach rezoning 2.4 plus or minus acres of property located on the north side of Bay Drive between Williams Road and Dillon Circle, addressed as 1031 Bay Drive, from Volusia County MH8A Rural Mobile Home Estate Airport Overlay to City RAA Rural Agricultural Estate Airport Overlay, providing for conflicting ordinances, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. All right, any ex parte communications, gentlemen, to disclose? Hearing none. Um, Mr. Mouthan, are you familiar? And please state whether it's consistent with the comp plan and your recommendation. I am familiar with the case. Uh, all three ordinances do meet our comprehensive plan, and staff recommends approval on all three ordinances. Thank you. Uh, applicants, any member of the commission have any questions? If nothing else, we'll now consider ordinance 47 20. So a motion to adopt ordinance 47-20. So moved. Second. Sharon, if you'll give it a beat and then call the roll. <laughs> we'll wait for Commissioner Clody. I do want to get you on the record as well that you have no ex parte communications on this item. That is correct. Okay. Uh, we had a motion to second. Sharon, if you'd call the roll, please. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Commissioner Sachs? Yes. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. Commissioner Hartman? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. Ordinance 48-20. Do I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. Sharon, if you'd call the roll, please. Commissioner Hartman? Yes. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Commissioner Sachs? Yes. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. And 49-20. Do I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. City Clerk, or, sorry. She's a beat. <laughs> I say that 20,000 times a meeting. Sharon, if you'd call the roll, please. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Commissioner Sachs? Yes. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. Commissioner Hartman? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. All right. Item 9A and B, our first readings. The city attorney will read these the first time by title only. Ordinance number 5120, an ordinance amending the New Smyrna Beach Code of Ordinances, amending Chapter 78, Traffic and Vehicles, Article 2, Parking, to create Section 7840. Delivery vehicles on Flagler Avenue, providing for codification, providing for public hearing, providing for conflicting ordinances, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Um, I, and while this is a first reading, I believe one of you may have comments for suggestions to refine this a bit. All right. We'll go ahead. Any comments on item A? Yes. Commissioner Vice Mr. Mayor. Mayor. Yep. Uh, I read through the, uh, the ordinance. I fully support it. But I think it uh, needs a little refinement. Right now it just uh, says you can't park on Flagler, which kind of leads you to believe that you could park on Jessamine, Florida, Pine, Peninsula, North Atlantic, and whatever. So I think we need some minor changes to the wording, but I think we should go through with the first hearing at this point. So we should make that wording basically you can only park in these loading and unloading zones, right? Well, I did discuss it uh, with the attorney, okay. and, we, and I think we'll see some minor changes that won't affect the title. I just uh, want to make sure everybody's on yeah. board with the some. Uh, my proposed revision would be in Section 7840A, and I would need Brian's input as well, but um, that... No delivery vehicles may stop along Flagler Avenue, comma, and then I can add in those other streets. Um, and there was, wasn't there two parts to it? Um, well, I can work with Brian and make sure we tighten it down. 
wouldn't it be rather than trying to be exclusive and list a whole bunch of people places they can't park wouldn't it be better to just list you have to park here and just that excludes everywhere that's not listed and enumerated it's just it's wording changes okay. that's all yeah it's just my thoughts y'all you know, can figure it out uh, a question that I had on this one also for the gentleman earlier it, it did dawn on me as he was talking you know it, a coffee shop does a tremendous amount of business in the hours that we're talking about a loading and unloading zone versus a restaurant that opens for lunch only is very different so if we do have some proposed zones in that area we probably should take a look at that in front of businesses that are morning type businesses. They may, they may close by noon. So anyway, just a thought. I know that ship has sailed a little bit. But. Mr. Mayor, question please? Yes. I know it's not related to this item, but when can we discuss the truck route? It, it is tangentially related. I'll give it to you. Um, <laughs> yeah. In progress, uh, we should be Bringing that back, I think June 23rd is our target to look at truck route as well as those surrounding streets, possibly um, call it restrictions on truck access to those routes. Yeah, I thought we'd given staff the green light on that, so it sounds like they're un it's underway. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item B, City Attorney. Ordinance number 5220, an ordinance amending the New Smyrna Beach Code of Ordinances. Amending Chapter 58-2, hours established for use of parks and recreation areas. Amending Chapter 78, traffic and vehicles, Article 2, parking mm -hmm. Section 7849 to increase fines for parking violations at boat ramps. Amending Section 7854 to clarify permitted boat trailer parking, creating Section 7855 designating all city boat launch parking areas as tow-away zones. Providing for codification, providing for public hearing, providing for conflicting ordinances, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Okay. And I believe um, there may be comments on this one as well. It was me. <laughs> I have one comment at least. Uh, I, I was just going to suggest uh, towing is an extremely, uh, so the officer and I on Sunday rode by, and then we came back by 20 minutes later, and they were still trying to tow the same car because they had to get a different truck. And anyway, towing is a little bit antiquated in some ways. Uh, but putting a boot on is extremely fast, efficient. You don't have to deal with taking possession of someone's property. Accomplishes the exact same thing, unless you're trying to physically move the car because it's parked in front of a fire hydrant or somebody's driveway or something. So I would just propose we give staff the leniency to expand that to allow other methods of immobilization or uh, otherwise just, you know, same concept as towing. Um, I also was hoping that we could look at the $35 ticket that's elsewhere in this ordinance. I know it wasn't the wasn't the point of how it got brought up, but I spent time Sunday. I actually wrote four parking tickets myself on Sunday. They didn't give me a... I, I did not. <laughs> I didn't put my business card. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I, I, I got to... I wrote a few, but I'll tell you, I wrote a $35 parking ticket and slid it under the, the, uh, the windshield of a probably $70,000 Land Rover, and it felt like a pointless exercise because I don't think they cared. And so I don't think our fines are high enough. I think our officers, <laughs> got to tell you, doing a fantastic job. They're doing all they can, um, but we haven't given them, given them enough tools in the tool bag if we really wanted to get serious about this. So we can save that debate for the second reading um, and, and bring that back possibly uh, I'll, at another time, but those are just my thoughts on, on this item. Vice Mayor. Well, my thought is uh, I know we're planning to increase the uh, fine for the trailer parking. I would like to see it uh, further increased for second and third violations, perhaps to 200 and to 300. And that, uh, if we can do that, I would like to see us uh, do that. That have to be managed probably on the back end because in the in the field, I mean these these people these officers are trying to just turn these out. They don't they're not going to be able to pull up and have at their fingertips. I don't feel like the knowledge of if it's a second or third violation. But okay. I love the idea if we can do it on the back end somehow. But correct, because not having received one of those tickets, I don't know what it says on it if it has a uh, particular dollar amount. Uh, I like the concept, however it's worked out. Yeah, I have a lot more thoughts on this, but. I will save them for my 
Mayor comments. Just one thing I need to share on the, um, so there's chapter 316 and 318. It's a very confusing um, interplay between those two chapters of Florida statute. There are state law maximums on parking ticket violations. There are certain things they allow local governments to do. And so if we're targeting a particular problem, we can, so for example, boat launch parking. We can exceed those maximum rates, which is what we have with that $100 there. Um, and that the $100 is consistent with what Port Orange is doing. And there's, there's a suggestion that maybe 100 is the max. Um, so I just wanted to throw out a caution of I wouldn't be comfortable recommending an, a general overall increase in all parking violations beyond what we have. Um, the other thing I wanted beyond to mention. Beyond the 35? Beyond, for just a general. If we were targeting a specific problem, like if we targeted a specific area like parking violations on Flagler, if there's a specific area, then I think we have more ability under home rule to go after that to exceed the state law maximum. Wow. So these are my <laughs> recommendations. You don't have to follow them, but yeah. I do have to give you the advice. I parked um, in New Orleans legally, but just stayed in the spot a little too long and got a 158 or something dollar ticket. Different state. Different I, state. I understand that, but so. I never did it again is the point. <laughs> <laughs> $35 uh, was bad. We if it were a specific area, you know, if it's like a specific The city problem. of New Smyrna. No. <laughs> That's okay. our specific that area. That being said, and the other, the other thing is just in the last few hours, I've been looking at the city of Orlando and, and their immobilization and towing language. The other thing they also have is they do, if there's three or more outstanding parking violations, any, they send it to the state database. So I'll be working on trying to update. I'll try to incorporate the immobilization. I'll try to incorporate three or more parking violations go to the state database, but those will probably be under separate sections um, than what I currently have crafted for the immediate needs. Yeah. You checked under the box for me, that state database, that we have repeat offenders, we have collection rates are probably not what they should be because we don't have enough teeth to be able to collect on the back end. So we got great officers doing great work, and then nothing comes of it. So, uh, Mayor, comment? Sure. So we charge $20 to park a car, and then we raise the fine to $35. doesn't seem to be commensurate. It doesn't seem to be enough. People just gladly pay it. It's like a slap on the wrist. We have a tremendous, serious parking problem in our city. People parking on, look, I know there's easement, there's all that. You can debate it. I'm half on the road, half on the lawn, but they're they're leaving you in waste. They're leaving garbage. They're cursing out the people who tell them not to park on their sprinkler heads. I mean, we have a real serious problem. So I know it's certainly not popular. I'm not here to gain popularity, but it's to help to try to maintain law and order in our city. So I'm, I'm wondering if we should raise just to for, forget the boats and the truck and trailer right now or even discuss that as well, but we should raise the fines for cars illegally parked to $50, perhaps. Uh, I think put a one in front of that, but that's just me. I, I'm telling you, I, 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 what I saw Sunday changed my perspective entirely, but I'll talk about that later. Just um, to our attorney, with the changes we're thinking of proposing, like the reporting it to the state, does that fall into the, can we make those changes on a second reading, or do we have to reintroduce this? Uh, well, we can keep going with these two, but I'm probably coming back with additional language for the state database um, and the immobilization. I'll need to work that in a different area of the code. Okay. So that would be a subsequent type of thing. Okay. Correct. Good start. All right. So that was the first reading, so no further action needed. You did the first reading, right? You were finished? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Good comments on that. Next item up, item 10A, Utilities Commission. Is there a motion to accept the resignation of Mr. Lee Griffith? So moved. Second. Sharon, if you would call the roll, please. Commissioner Sachs? Yes. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. 
Commissioner Hartman? Yes. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. All right, his resignation has been accepted. Thank you, Mr. Griffith, for your service to the community and the UC NSB. Um, we have many applicants. I think the clerk gave each of you this document, which basically just summarizes the, uh, the different applicants. There are some on the back listed as well. Or did, did I just get this, or did everybody get it? All right, so if you find that document, do we have any nominations? Mr. Mayor. Yes. With so many people, I've gone through all the resumes. I got about six people I could support, but I, I really don't think that I've had enough time to really go through all these. That's my problem. I'm glad to hear you say that because I was right there with you. I, there was a few resumes that really intrigued me, and I wanted to call and talk to them, and I just didn't have a chance. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. I so. I can go for today with some known quantities, but I'd love to talk to a few folks that I'd, I'd never seen their name before, but I was intrigued by their backgrounds. Can make a motion to table because I feel the same. <coughs> Someone make we a motion. Have so we have, abundance of was you were you making was that a where is that a were you making that motion or was that a question? <laughs> I would support make that motion. motion. Make the motion. All right, motion. I'll second. Table. Motion the table to next meeting. Next meeting. Okay, we got a second. Sharon, if you'd yes. call the roll, please. Commissioner Sachs? Yes. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. Commissioner Hartman? No. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. Um, now, we ran into this one time before, so I want clarity before it happens so that we all know how we'll handle it. We have a list of, I don't know, let's call it 10, 12 names here. Or more. If yeah, whatever. If someone applies between now and then, are we are we accepting that, or are some commissioners against that? No. All right. So just just so there's clarity, so we're really not seeking additional help, and we can't stop someone. But I don't believe the commission would consider that. So, all right. Good clarity. <coughs> all right, Mayor and Commission reports. Uh, we'll start with. Man, y'all threw me off now. We'll start with the Vice Mayor and we'll go in our normal order. I'll just have to bounce around. Vice Mayor. You figured that one out. You just call on somebody. I've gotten good at it with the Zoom. I keep having to like picture where everybody is in the Zoom meeting. So, All right, Vice Mayor. The parking conditions in the North Beach are so far out of whack that uh, I don't see a real solution at this point except really strict enforcing. I've had requests from five other residents out there for parking signs and stop signs and almost anything else. Uh, I know we maintain a uh, database. I, I spoke with the uh, manager about this, a database as to uh, the number of signs and everything. But I think we have to do a uh, a real look into this. Make sure all the signs that we've authorized are put up and, and come up with some real definitive uh, policy. Manual uniform traffic control devices, if we follow that, we'll never have another stop sign in town. We talked about uh, adjusting it. I will make my recommendations to uh, staff as to how we can make it even remotely possible to have a stop sign put in, but uh, we should do it. And we should um, adhere to it once it's in place. I know Commissioner Hartman likes that idea, I hope. Uh, Canal Street businesses, we're, we're talking about possibly closing off the street. Uh, I wasn't, uh, I didn't really think it would be a real success if they came up with a definitive plan to do that, even though I, I said I was opposed to just closing it in general. I would give that a second look. And the last thing uh, is the collection of our parking tickets. I know we send it out to an agency that uh, I don't know how well they do. I know the staff keeps track of it, but I've heard that there might be as much as $200,000 sitting out there that's uncollected. And we could certainly use that in our budget. So. 
if the staff has a plan to speed them up, I would like to see it. Chief is, is working with the staff on finding another uh, company out there that will work with this. So. Right, and also just the people who get tickets, if they don't have to pay them, they'll just violate again. So we should, we should uh, work to follow through, and I appreciate that. Once again, police are working very hard. The residents in the, in the North End, Beachside, really appreciate it. I, I've had a number of really positive comments on that. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Sachs, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I first want to send kudos out to uh, Lisa Martin. We all know Lisa. She's a very engaging, civic-minded resident. She's been helping to feed the needy. Uh, I think it's an admirable thing to do. Uh, I try to lend some support where I can, some spaghetti, some rice, some sauce, anything you can make a quick dinner for your family. I, I think we really need that. I haven't seen the need, but I know the food is going to good places. So if, if anybody uh, you know, has an extra dollar in their pocket, go over to Publix, get a twofer, do what you can to help the needy. I know we have food banks. And, and uh, she's just one lady who's, who's doing a good job there. Uh, I have a question for staff. Um, I had a resident ask me about solicitors. They're very afraid to answer the door, especially in these times of COVID. So is it true that if we provide a soli no solicitor sign in our yard, that we can get on a list with the police department to be on a list for no solicitors? Is that so? You do have a list. So if they have the sign, they can call and get on the list. There's no sign, there's a list. Okay, so they... They register them and put them on the list. Okay, so they're not required to have a no solicitor sign. Thank you, Chief. Sorry, I'm reading tiny print here. Um, another question came up, and I actually had to get involved and didn't really want to. Um, code enforcement. We had an incident on our street where... Five people came to their commissioner and complained, and they told me they were afraid to complain. I get it. I understand. And so I had to make the complaint for them. So the person confronted me, and I said, well, I'm the commissioner. What can I tell you? But the, the question is, can people remain anonymous if they ask to remain anonymous? I understand if there's a public records request, if things go to court and such, they may have to reveal their name. But if they call and say, I, I'm afraid, I wish to remain anonymous, that they do. So that's a big... And, and you, Judy Commissioner, we don't give out the names. Uh, however, if they ask for a public record request, then that might. But uh, normally we don't, we don't go out and give out the names. So. All right, good, please. Um, but it is a public record, just to be... I mean, it's, it's not... We can't anonymize that, right? If they ask for the public record request over the if, phone. If someone ask. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Uh, we I don't volunteer it. Let's put it that way. Okay, good. Please. Uh, I want to thank Colin. We, uh, he had mentioned to me, I, I hope you heard in your briefings, we may have testing in our city for COVID. And a lot of people have been asking for it. They didn't trust the county. I trust the county to do it. It's their job. They're testing. They're tracing. Um, but we may offer it in our city, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, you know, we, we did hear from the Canal Street restaurants. They wanted to do an event at night. My considerations were this. Please give it two weeks, and let's see where the trend goes. Unfortunately, the trend went up. The, the infections and even the mortalities have increased. And I was hoping to see a 14-day downward trend. We did not. But it still doesn't mean I won't consider their request to open the street uh, for dining. Well, well let's, I'd like to take a look at that. Um, I understand other cities are doing it, and maybe we can try it. Have pe ask people to be uh, to abide by CDC guidelines, socially distance. Uh, maybe the server can wear a mask. Just small things that we can ask them to do to keep from getting sick. I'm wearing a mask, and trust me, I. I <coughs> If I didn't think I had to wear a mask, I wouldn't be wearing this inconvenient thing. It's better than wearing a respirator. Trust me. Um, 
Thank you, guys. Just please, folks, for your for your family, for your lives, for your grandma, your children, wear a mask when you go into a store, when you go out in a public space. I know outside, it's uh, you know, we can take our masks off, but it, it, you know, it, this is serious stuff. It, you don't have to believe it, but I'm just pleading with you to take caution. Thank you, guys. Okay. Finished. Thank you. Is that it? All right. Yeah. Commissioner McGirt. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the homeless issue, I brought that up during the visioning. I said it's going to come up and slap us in the face, and I think we're starting to see that. Unfortunately, we're having a lot of people complain. A lot of people are having problems. And most people do not want to come to a commission meeting. <coughs> They're out there. I think we're going to need to make some tough choices. I think it's going to be necessary, and I think it's not necessarily fortunate, but I think there's some tough issues that we're going to have to consider because we can't kick the homeless issue down the road. I know Commissioner Hartman feels strongly in one direction. I disagree with him on that. Um, I think that the workshop should, is going to be important, but I will tell you that um, it's not something that we can continue to accommodate, and I think we're going to need to get a little aggressive about it to be able to try to beat back the, uh, the problem. Um, with COVID-related cases, um, I share a lot of Jake's feelings. Um, I was a little... I was a little bothered by the fact that there were so many people in this room. As we learn, the longer COVID goes on, we learn more about it. And at least the latest is sitting in a room with low airflow, flow, with people continuously talking. It's a time exposure issue. That's us. That's exactly what we just did. We're doing. What their research is now showing them is the highest rate of infection possibility. Not boxes being delivered, not the cereal box from Publix, but it's close proximity to people who have it in their respiratory um, droplets that come out of their mouth sitting in a confined area for an extended period of time. I, un I see the emails, I, I get them, I have people who stop me complaining about the public comment. I think we can possibly set tents out outside put chairs underneath them, protect people from the rain or from the, 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 the sun. There's different things that we can do if the cases continue to rise. I look at this situation and I've said, we're opening everything back up. Let's watch what happens. Does the heat, does the sun, the humidity affect the virus? Does it degradate it to where we're going to be pretty safe at least for the next six months? The point is, I also am very concerned about the cases rising and I think we should pay close attention to it. And I um, want you, the commission, to know how I feel about it. I don't, as if cases continue to rise as they are and not go down, I'm not excited about a room full of people who want to speak for a, three minutes. They can come in. We can let them in. We don't necessarily have to stop. We can come out there. I have no problem addressing the people who come for public participation and simply telling them my thoughts and, politely requesting that they go out there. And if they don't, maybe that's fine too. They come in, but maybe 50% of the people are willing to say, hey, yeah, you know what? I don't need to be in the room. I can sit out here in a chair underneath the tent and they'll call me in when it's my time to speak. So anyway, I know we're feeling our way through this, but I want to bring that up, let you know what my concerns were, <coughs> and, uh, and we'll kind of feel our way through it. Thank you, Mayor. So, so as all of you have commented, I've also heard from several people who live beachside on the response from the police officers this past weekend. Nothing but positive remarks. Um, the individuals that were out on the street explaining the people on Beach Way that the beach was closed, they'd have to turn around. They said they were always polite and courteous to everybody they ever talked to. So please let your staff know that they were seen and everybody did take notice of that and thank you for the good job that you were doing. Um, on the issue of homelessness, um, how many of you signed up for the webinar tomorrow on homelessness through the League of Cities? All right. I'm not. That's all I'll say. 
As I was to your report. <laughs> you'll, you'll have one. As I was reflecting back on this past weekend, um, you know, there was, Mayor, you had, gave a wonderful address. Thank you for that. But, you know, I was thinking about this is not a, about a four-day weekend, you know, or a trip to the beach. This was about um, those who died and paid the ultimate sacrifice for us, and it was a way to honor them. And I was kind of sad because, as Commissioner Girk has said more than once, there's a lot of events that we attend that you go, oh, we have to go to that again. But the Veterans Day, Memorial Day services, those are things that you truly look forward to. And I was wondering how many of those individuals that are usually at those meetings won't be to the next one. You know, they won't be there. Um, and it was kind of sad that, you know, we didn't have that tradition. I understand it and I support it tremendously. But, you know, I was just kind of reflecting back on that. And I said, man, this is a great time to see those older gentlemen and ladies who, who served and are respectfully uh, giving back to those who went before them, you know, who paid the ultrasexes. And then I was also thinking, and I'm going, you know, we didn't have a D.A.R.E. graduation this year. That was something that several of us always attended, and it was, it's, was thrilling to see the those youth and the officer who worked with them going through the program and hearing their stories and hearing their essays. And so there's so many things in this day and time that we've lost. But fortunately, we have those memories, and we can reflect back on those. So um, thank you for your speech that you gave. Um, it was really moving. Um, I think that we've heard all of these conversations that, that we've collectively had now, and we have a couple large issues coming before us. So please don't forget your position when we come to talk about those issues that are yet before us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I've got a few things here, so I'm, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, yeah, for, for Memorial Day, uh, as Commissioner Hartman mentioned, uh, definitely not like any other Memorial Day in recent history, at least. Um, but was glad, actually had something that came together very last minute that was able to, to put together um, uh, to, to honor the fallen. So, um, you know, if it had a little more warning, would have tried to involve even the commission, but um, was able to pull something together. And uh, so thanks to a few staff that helped out on that and even some private citizens that, that chipped in to help pull that off. So... Um, Couple of uh, couple of things um, on. I wanted to go back to something real quick. Actually, I guess we'll talk about it in the, like the COVID stuff because I don't want to start making motions in this part. But I heard a few of you, I think, hint around that you may be supportive of a street closure. So I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of that when we get there. Um, but I will focus on. I have three things then that are not COVID related. Uh, actually, maybe four. Uh, parking. So everyone has spoke about it. Uh, as I as I mentioned, I actually had the opportunity. Uh, Khaled and the chief set up Sunday morning um, from ten to about one. I was riding with uh, with one of our officers, and really, you know, it's one of those things you you kind of have to sit in that seat to see it from that perspective. Um, and so it did certainly. I learned a lot of things, um, not only from the officer, but just seeing some things firsthand. Um, one story that I felt like can r really just captured a lot of what I've heard anecdotally, and this is still just one data point I'll give you, but it, it really, I think this sums up where we are, and that is we turned on to, I think it was Sapphire, and literally a couple of families getting out of their, getting out of their car underneath a no parking sign. Two different cars. They were clearly together. Parking sign is here. The cars are here. So the officer's like, I'm about to, you know, ruin somebody's day. But so he pulls up and because they're still there. So uh, pulls up, goes and speaks to them. And so then while he's writing him a ticket, I'm like, hey, I'm going to get out and just go talk to these folks. So I go up and uh, introduce myself. I was like, hey, you know, really sorry this is your experience, but can I ask you a few questions while I, while I have you as a captive audience? And so I said, first of all, you know, where are you from? Two guesses, right? Orlando. So I said, um, 
When did your journey start? Like, when did you start heading to New Smyrna Beach? They said, we were up at 6 a.m. packing the car, getting the cooler ready, getting the kids ready, starting our way to New Smyrna Beach. Um, and I said, okay, so you get here, and you can't find parking. I was like, did you see any of the signs we had out on 44? Because we had, in addition to bringing an additional, so actually, let me stay, in addition to having Literally, I think every person that was authorized to do anything related to police work, including a few that weren't, out there on the streets, we brought in extra officers from other areas, other communities, to help support this community. We won a little bit of the lottery with the weather on Monday, depending on your, your vantage point, but that helped a little bit Monday. Um, but we, we had tremendous presence out there. We had one officer that, uh, that I talked to while I was out. He hadn't written a ticket in years. He had to ask this other officer, hey, can you just double check this, make sure, like, I haven't done one of these in a long time. And he, we had him out in a uniform helping to enforce basic civil traffic laws, uh, which I think was fantastic. I think the residents noticed, so I, I commend the officers. So I asked his family, did you, did you see the signs? Because we had also commissioned additional signage and put it on, on, out on 44. No, we didn't, we didn't see it. And uh, I was like, okay, so you get here. I said, obviously, you're already getting the ticket, so this isn't, you know, this isn't a court of law. I'm just curious. I was like, you parked under the sign. Like, did you see it? Did you not see it? Like, did you, you know, t talk me through the thought process. And he said, yeah. I said, I'm not an idiot. I saw the sign. He said, but I got my whole family in the car. Got, they got their family. We've been on this journey since 6 a.m. He's like, what am I going to do, leave and go back to Orlando? He's like, we're here. We're going to the beach. He said, I just thought I'd get by with it or at most, I just get a ticket, and I pay the ticket. So, and then the last thing I asked him was, I was like, hey, while you're, while you're in town, I was like, where else are you going? What's the plan? Is you here for the weekend? Are you just going to the beach? Like, what's the plan? And he said, uh, and it was kind of two gentlemen I was talking to, one for each family. And um, they're like, yeah, no, we're here for the, here for the day. And, uh, you know, we brought all our supplies and our food and everything is all here. Um, we did want to stop by an ice cream place on the way out of town. It wasn't Dairy Queen. I'm sorry to tell you, but is we going to stop by an ice cream place on the way out of town? It's unfortunate, but we know the Orlando people it, are it, not that knowledgeable. You know, they, don't yeah. know, they don't know really what the, they don't know the best. Place their taste of ice cream was not as refined as what you're saying. So, um, and it was it was fascinating to me because that's the anecdotal data point that I think we've all heard. Like. Hey, these are the folks that are really cogging, you know, the, 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 the fly in the ointment here. They're not really contributing a lot back to our local community. Definitely causing, uh, you know, a headache and a hassle with where they particularly parked it, creating an unsafe intersection. Um, but yet, you know, the, the most we had, in that case, we were, they were, because they were still with, I don't understand how this chief can explain it to, to you later. Because they were still with the car, we were, the, the ticket was actually a little bit heftier than the $35, but we continued to write tickets around the corner, and it was just, you know, these $35 tickets, and, and again, the car's there. We drove by hours later, the car's still there. It's like, hey, there's that car I wrote a ticket to. Still just flap it in the breeze. So, um, anyway, I, I came up with, I did have a couple of observations that I thought would be potentially some quick wins that might, would help, but we truly are at an inflection point kind of as a, as a community of, you know, can we turn the tide back? Can we somehow sift through and figure out these are the right people that we want here that our local economy depends on? And how do we, how do we attract them? And then these are the folks that we, it's really no skin off our back if they go to some other, some other beach town because they're not really contributing a lot to the local community. Or do we just say we have to kind of embrace all of it but also do things to protect the residential neighborhoods. Because I will tell you, there's a few streets we drove down. There would be a for sale sign on my property tomorrow if I lived on that street. I just I don't know how they deal with it. I couldn't deal with it. So a couple of things. Number one is uh, Smyrna Dunes Park. So we pulled up to, to try to go to Smyrna Dunes Park. Traffic is backed way up, way past the entrances to some of the different condos that are, that are back there. And so luckily we had blue lights, which come in really handy. And if I could get some of those, I'd really appreciate it. So we jumped over in the lane, drive all the way down to the park, go up, talk to the park attendant. And he's, we're like, hey, how long have you been full? He's like, I've been packed since 8 a.m. He's like, so I start talking to different cars in the line. I said, how long have you been in line? I've been sitting here an hour. I've been sitting here an hour and 20 minutes. Like these cars are just sitting there for an hour clogging up this roadway. 
So basically, officer said, all right, if you're in the driveway, like, all right, we'll get, I, I literally directed, pulled everybody, was like, tuck in, get as many people as you can in, and then everybody else turning around, like, we got to clear the road. You can't get to the Coast Guard station. People couldn't get to their homes that lived back there. So as we're driving out, the officer and I, we were talking about it, and I said, you know, if we just had someone kind of manning this one intersection way back here that was in communication with the Dunes Park, but they were at that intersection where the entrance to the... Um, Oh, well, the Menorcan Bay and, and there's one across the street. If they were there, basically saying you can't go past here. Like unless unless they've got a call that says there's an open spot, it's a turnaround here. Because otherwise you're just going to be parked in our street, blocking all our entrances to these businesses. Um, so I think we could. I think there's some a quick thing there. The other thing I realized is if we had a penalty that was actually meaningful, if we truly wanted to start enforcing and and reclaiming our neighborhoods. And I think we should only do it if we pair it with some parking solutions elsewhere. I'll, I'll caveat all this with that. But if we really wanted to do it, I think the no parking sign needs to have the dollar amount on there, kind of like when you pull up to a handicap sign. Because, but again, not if it's only 35 bucks, because I think then we'd make the problem worse, frankly. Um, but I think it needs to have the dollar amount and also talk about the, the other potential enforcement. Like, you will be towed or you will be booted or something like that. So if we wanted to get serious about it, that's what it's going to take. That's how you change human behavior. I also think we have to step up, perhaps in, in addition with the county, maybe this is one way they can help us, uh, is we need more signage west of 95, possibly even all the way out on I-4, that is tied in and somehow sending the signal that you know the wait times are over an hour, the beaches are full. The beaches are, we got to get creative with this to change human behavior. Because again, I talked to these folks and they drove by probably three or four signs that said that and they didn't see it. So whatever we got to do, we got to change up that. It's got to be flashing. It's got to be something. Had, by the way, we had two signs uh, on 44, just west of 95 yep. and west of Venetian Bay. Yeah. Um, I'm saying we're going to need, we're going to have to do one of those things, you know, like when you roll by the bowl of peanut stand, like it's like sign, 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 sign. Like I think we're going to need... It's got to be a little more because obviously those two are not, you know, or they just assume they're going to get here and figure it out. And then that's where all these other measures come into play. So we're not going to solve all that today. I just wanted to share some of my firsthand observations. If you haven't done that, July 4th is coming up. I highly recommend it. I, seriously, it changed my perspective. Not that I've never done it, but, you know, frankly, I don't go in every nook and cranny on our busy holiday weekends. You know, I... I I try to stay away from the place, frankly, because you told me to one time. You said, yeah. don't come over. So, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll pause there. I got some other stuff, but go ahead. So, no, it was interesting. Probably about eight years ago, I went to Blue Springs on a holiday weekend. Yeah. I didn't think anything of it. So, we'll get over there. It's probably going to be a little busy. So, there's a long residential road, yeah. and I'm backed up miles. And finally, I'm like, what's going on? This is crazy. It's not moving. So I call Blue Springs and I say, hey, man, what's going on? Is there an accident up there or something? And they're like, no, this is normal for a holiday weekend. I said, I said I'm, you know, I'm in this line. What's everybody waiting for? And he said, oh, no, people wait. So that, so the, and I said, people actually wait? And I said, how long till I get in? And she says, and I told her the address. She knew the, I told yeah. her the address of the house. She had an idea of where the, ad, the, front, the house I was parked in front of. And she says, hour and a half, two hours. And I said, people will wait in this line on this residential road, blocking all this, for an hour and a half, two hours to get into the park. And she says, that, absolutely. I, of course, I turned around and, and left, yeah. but people are, are, who, who are willing to do that is our problem. And I love your story. I think that they saw the signs, and maybe he didn't want to admit it, but people are conditioned that once they come, they want, they want to, people, and, and my point is, people who are willing to wait in a line for two hours to go to a park, man, it's a tough one. I, yeah. And so here's, here's, and I agree, I mean, at one point I'm like, $250 fine. Here's the problem. We're going to enact this, we we'll change something, and then we're going to get a lot of calls from local people from a Monday and a Tuesday and a, a day, cold day in November. It's a, it's a great and point. they're going to be like, man, it, I have this fine, and and we're going to have to justify it to our residents. And there's going to be no justifying it to them. So it's a double-edged sword. And as long as we know going in, and I know we have to do something, 
I get the calls from yeah. this district. We all know 44 backs up. So it's not an easy solution. Yeah. And and we're going to get it and we're going to we're going to pay the price on that with I, locals getting those tickets. I I, I I agree. I there was some there was one car clearly that was low, I, they got a ticket and it was a carload of teenagers that drove by and they were like I heard him yell out the window like oh that's Billy's truck and then later code enforcement was there writing him a ticket and they drove back by and they were taking pictures like probably texting Billy you know and it was you know 386 local on the truck like yes I I hear you and you know this particular you caught us at high tide so there's nowhere else to go and that's why I'm saying I think this has to be paired with other solutions. I don't think we can just say we're going to just clamp this down without providing some other solutions. But some of the stuff I do think, there was one street, and I can't remember which one it was. Um, I've got it somewhere because somebody sent me a video of it. But it, it was effectively reduced to a one-way street because people were parked on both sides, some of them the wrong way, which we wrote those tickets. But they, it was effectively reduced to a one-way street. And I'm like, again, if I lived on the street, my quality of life just tanked. And that's, that's not fair to that resident. And, you know, I'm, again, I'm not trying to, I know how many of our businesses depend on tourism. I'm not sure they depend on those tourists. I don't know how to sort those out, but I don't think they depend on those tourists. It's but a, It's a diminishing return. I've said that. We, yeah. hit, we far exceeded, the, we're in a diminishing return yep. with the numbers we're seeing. Yeah, I, I don't think the people there were leaving to, to go to the garlic. Like, I just, I, I just right. don't think that's the, the path. So, anyway, said enough about that. It's, it's a top-of-mind topic for me. We were making, I felt like, some, we were at least talking about parking. Um, I think we have to go back to that. We have to talk about service lot, surface lots if we're not going to go vertical with it. Uh, I also gained a different perspective on I, some other areas. I think we could go, um, you know, I was really sold on trying to do as much in the Flagler area as possible, but frankly... You know, I think we could even go further south and, and do some things in, in more of a, uh, you know, a district that is not, is not Flagler. So there's areas in third waves. So anyway, third avenue, rather. Um, so we're going to continue that. I'm going to keep bringing it up. I wanted to just share those experiences, and that tees up the conversation we'll have about the, the fees later, uh, the, the additional enforcement and booting. Um, but we're, we're also going to need some guidance on, you know, are there things we can we can do for locals? Um, you know, can we can we not write them tickets? I don't know, because it gives you their address when you pull it up in the system. Huh? So, all right, uh, two other things. Uh, one, I wanted to call out something that happened earlier today. Uh, the uh, councilwoman Denny's, our representative. Um, asked for and received unanimous support to allocate of the CARES money that the uh, county had gotten directly from the federal government. Uh, they allocated up to $15 million to cities for COVID-related expense recovery, not revenue offset, because I asked about that. I said, hey, I'm, my sports center is bleeding. Can I, can I recoup some of that revenue? You can't, but you can try to recoup expenses. Uh, it's allocated. With it. They're still working out the details. That'll be next Tuesday, I think. Um, but it's allocated based on the gas tax formula. So I think that's like the max we'll qualify for. And then obviously we have to uh, have the expenses that we've tracked. So uh, staff will no doubt work with the county. I think we have been tracking those expenses hopefully very well. Uh, I'd encourage you to be very comprehensive in that. Things like the Zoom subscriptions we had to buy I think should qualify. The go to meeting that Carmen had to buy, all those related meetings, perhaps even some of Carmen's time, I could easily justify in this if it fits all the right parameters. Um, so that is that. But I did just want to share that good news and thank Councilwoman Denise for her support. Um, there are a few mayors that are wanting to send a letter. We, we have one subset of our business community that is still completely closed, hasn't had a revenue dime in the past, you know, since late February, and that is our bars. And I, I think I get the governor's stance in that, you know, a bar and a nightclub in Miami can have a thousand people in it. That's very different than our little local, you know, watering holes that we have. Um, so there are a few mayors that are wanting to send a letter to the governor asking on behalf of those uh, employees at those establishments that they allow, be allowed to reopen or at least grant local control for that reopening. Um, 
full disclosure, I intend in my, as Vice, as Vice Mayor said, and, and my kind of personal capacity, I do intend to support that. I think it could be done. I think it could be done safely. I think it's the government picking winners and losers in private business, which I don't subscribe to. Um, I'd love it if I could say on behalf of the city, but if I can't, if the commission isn't comfortable with that, I'll just sign it as with my title. So I did just want to make you all aware of that. And um, not really asking for a motion, but just telling you that's what I'm going to do. And I guess my question would be, I don't know how I want to phrase it. I'll just sign it with my name. I'll just leave it there. That's the easiest way to do it. Just giving you a heads up, I'm going to do it. Um, and then the last thing is, um, I know I've been talked to, I think they've talked to each of you all, but we've got that lot on Smith Street, I think it is, by the barn that the, they've been redoing, and they are wanting to work with the city, potentially use that lot temporarily or permanently for parking. Um, and I guess I just wanted to make sure we all got on the same page with staff as to how we're going to approach that. We have a whole different conversation about leases over here and how we're going to handle them. Um, you know, m my thought is it, it looks terrible. Now it looks like a prison yard right now. So I... I I'm okay with it if we don't have a use for it. Um, I don't necessarily just want to hand it on a silver platter to that business in particular. I, I just say we evaluate that property and maybe others to say, is this our highest and best use? And would we want to put this out via some kind of RFP or something else? Um, so anyway, I don't know if that's coming before us formally or if you're waiting for us to bring it up or how, that, how that's going to happen. what we do is we draft the RFP. We bring it to you. Um, and then if you're okay with it, we will advertise it, have the selection committee, and then... We'll to be clear, though, we don't, I don't think we have to do an RFP. I don't think that's our... We don't have to. Uh, so I'm just saying what my brothers are, but I think... I know they've approached me, and yeah, I think they're the going to come talk to us. I would, so. I would, my recommendation would be to go with the RFP. So. But it's up to the commission. But, I mean, originally we were talking about leasing it to the hospital, and we weren't going to RFP that. But we gave him uh, the hospital. We just kind of gave him a, a draft lease just to see, you know, what it is. But that was two years ago. So, uh, again, the hospital is different than a private business. So. Mr. Mayor, how about yes. Considering it is a city parking lot, I know it's not the closest to Canal Street, but for special events, we had an opportunity to buy the church lot one of them, and we passed that up. I was only a block and a half from Canal. I mean, we have our needs, too. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. I, I mean, I can't see myself using it to go to Canal. I've never had a problem parking, even at special events around Canal, frankly. And I'm, I'm not trucking a family across 44, something about the 44. If it were on this side of 44, I'd be all over it. But that side of 44, I, just, I view differently, personally. But You know, they mentioned that they don't mind people using it during the day because really th their use is yeah. at night. Sp special event, yeah, and, and they'll know exactly when they need it. So anyway, I just they've approached me. I, I don't have an issue with it. I think it would be a great use of the property. I think we could monetize it at least for a couple of years. It doesn't. We don't have to lock into it full time permanently. Um, but I think it's going to be, uh, if we operate on their timeline, I think it's going to come at us faster than this whole lease discussion, which needs to happen because these are the kind of things we deal with on how do, how do we you know how do we deal with this so go ahead no i uh, i wouldn't enter any lease that has any any time length to it we have the issue of insurance we have the issue of who's going to do the improvement work uh, we do have the hospital nearby it's also a great place to put up some tabby houses so I think we got to be very careful short term. I have no problem. We also uh, know that that property has limitations on its use based on it providing parking. And uh, as much as I like the owners and the concept and the work they've done, I don't think there should be any real special treatment. We we got to tread very carefully. Uh, that's my thing. I just want to... I'll be out there. I think what they know at the property is amazing. I can support it. I just think we 
we have to follow some process to be able to to do that and make sure we've we've covered all the bases and and that we can defend what we've done to uh, with the people's land to the people of New Smyrna. So, question is that brownfield? Does anyone know? Yeah, I think so. Brownfield. Yeah. yeah. You got, you, you, Big time. Housing would be. No. Yeah. Well, yeah, they have a remediation yeah. assessment on it. So. Yeah. The utilities did. Again, it's terrible right now. I mean, it's it's a it's an eyesore. It's blight right now, and we own it. I mean, I'm a little bit ashamed. I mean, it's got a prison yard fence around. It's got like barbed bar on the top. So, um, anyway, they're going to be coming at us again. I'm sure they've talked to each of you. I just wanted to see if we could get out ahead of it and and give staff some guidance so that when they were approached. So anyway, talk to staff individually. Give me your thoughts. I've shared mine. Go ahead. I think we should have some kind of discussion. We all know that what this is about. Um, the property is in terrible condition. We tore down the Smith Street station. The hospital is going to use it. The hospital is not interested. The hospital is obviously not going to be staying there. We all know that. So they're not interested in any lease. Um, I see no reason why we can't move forward. Although do it with complete transparency and make sure we're following some kind of process Yeah. Um, to get this rented out. And of course, in terms of, you know, to me, it's, a, it's an easy business lease. Uh, you're going to have a term. They're going to do all the improvements to it at their cost. Yep. And we can consider whether or not we give them some options. But a typical three-year Five-year lease with some options to pick up with a with a um, with a uh, cost. Not, I say cost of living, a CPI yeah. increase every yeah. year. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to skin this cat without committing. It'll be yeah. at market value. Um, so I'm comfortable with moving forward on something. I guess the question is, what is that something? Yeah, that's what I just wanted to get out ahead of that, and I I think that. Doing so, I'm okay with doing something with the property, but you know what I don't know is you know I'm just making up numbers, so I'll use I'll use stupid numbers. If they come and offer us a you know a, a fifty cents, just making up a number, how do I know the business over you know some business two doors down and around the corner in that little strip plaza doesn't want to offer us two dollars? And I say, hey, you know, my first interest is the city in our our position. I love that facility. I love what they've done. I hope my one of my daughters gets married in it. But it's not my obligation to provide their parking for them at below market rates. So I want to make sure that we do the best business transaction because I treat all of this as I would if I had my name over the door. And that's what I would do. I'd go out and say, yeah, I love the concept, but is is you know how do I how do I come up with that fair market rate and know that it's a fair market? And then so that's that's just where I'm at. So and last comment. Yes, sir is I think it should be short term whatever we do. Agreed. We have we have other maintenance facilities there that we're talking hopefully with the UC about combining and moving out. So we could assemble a pretty good sized piece of land there. And, and when you say in uh, vice mayor short term, what's two years. Um. Well, let's put it this way. It's it's up for discussion. I agree with them. Two, two to three years. To have a business like that, and uh, and this is part of the condition for them to open the business to have parking, so that would be an issue, right? Yeah, they they will be here scheduled for your next meeting to discuss a special exception on that property. So, so parking will be a topic of that. Their their capacity is dependent on parking. Yeah, it's very limited right now. Yeah, and and part of it, I mean. And again, they probably talked to each of us. And I don't want to bring this whole discussion to the day. I was just trying to get out of it, out ahead of it, and try to give staff some direction, and even give them some indicators of you know how this process might look. Because frankly, when I talked to them, I said, "Look, I, I love the concept. I just don't know what this process looks from here forward. Like, what do we do next? Is it RFP? Is it you come and talk to the commission, and then you offer us fill in the blank number? How do I know whether that's a good number or a bad number? I, you know, so that's." That's the part I didn't know and just wanted it out there in full transparency. But it, one interesting wrinkle is they can create more parking on their site, but it would require paving things that isn't already paved. And so it's like, do we want to do that? Or do we want to allow them to possibly use this, you know, 
prison yard over here and make it look nice and then protect the area that doesn't look so great to begin with. So, I mean, looks good to begin with. Uh, normally we put it out for a month. Which they, you know, they, yeah, yeah. So we'd they're have wanting to, to go. Come up with the terms. Yeah, I'm saying after we come up with the RFP. Right. When you put it, when you advertise it, you advertise it for a month. Yeah. Okay. Some areas we have done 21 days, but. And then there's time with the opening and all of that, and then selecting one. Back here. Yep. I could give you a schedule at the next meeting, kind of give you an idea of what it takes to go through the RFP process. Well, we're going to have to, I, mean, I think we're going to have to have some kind of um, process. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the commission, not us doesn't have a good track record with leased properties. And we have to treat this very carefully. That's why I'm bringing it up right now. Good. <laughs> well, because I mean, we just had to do this whole thing with the, you know, the, the boat and ski. I mean, this is a whole broader discussion that we're not going to solve tonight. And we got to get through COVID. So I'm about to shut up. But we, we had the whole thing with boat and ski club. And you say, you know, okay, well, let's go to RFP for that. All right, well, great. What if uh, an outlaw motorcycle gang is the high bidder? How do I, you know, how do I... You got to have some other measurement than just bottom line, because we're not just a private business whose you know job is to maximize revenue. We have other we have you know many other functions that we serve. So anyway, that, that's that's what we have to figure out in that whole lease workshop we're going to have at and some we'll, point. We'll have the RFP to have the criteria in it, not just based on on uh, on price. Yeah. But you could put some other criteria in and give us some some points. So so yeah. when he evaluates. The price would not be the only factor there. Correct. And that's what we're going to have to do. And what I'm saying is, from my conversation with them, you know, they've got weddings booked. And so they're going to be looking for quick action. And I'm saying we don't have the, I can't plug them into something that is a process. So I'm trying to jumpstart that even a little bit today by just planting the seed uh, to try to help them out. But, um, but I'm not, we have to do what's right for us more than, more than them, so. Supposed to visit the site tomorrow. So. Yes, uh, that was all that I had. Sorry, gentlemen, that took so long. I have other stuff on COVID, but I'll leave it to that. So, Khaled, you're up. Okay. Um, I guess first one is uh, the June 9th. We have the strategic planning uh, meeting, and that would be at five o'clock. It's a workshop. Um, obviously, the homeless. This was scheduled before the homeless. Then we said the homeless will be on the 9th. So now we're going to try to move the homeless to the 23rd. And hopefully we'll have the consultant and also the chief has reached out to uh, people from uh, First Step. They were ready to come on the 9th and now he has to go back. And so as soon as we set this, the 23rd for the homeless, we'll reach out to them again and see if they will come in. I think that would be a big help. And that created another issue for us because the commission was supposed to discuss the leases on city properties on the 23rd. My suggestion and recommendation would be to move it to the budget workshop that we are doing in August. So this way you can discuss the budget and the leases as well. You gave 90 days from the, uh, the, the lease were expired on July 31st. So you have up until the end of October. November, so we'll do that in August if the commission wishes to do that. So, otherwise, we could do it on June the 30th during the mini budget workshop where we hand you the budget. So, would you rather do it on the 30th or the August for the discussing the leases? I vote June 30th. It's a lot, but I mean, some of the stuff's going to come at us quick. I'm seeing nods, nods. All right, June 30th. Okay. As long so as that doesn't over. So do June it. 30th, we'll give you the. It's a mini mini budget workshop, and we'll be discussing the leases. Yep. Um, the other thing is the uh, charter review. We're planning to have two public workshops between now and 
the 18th. So I have selected two days, if it's okay with the commission, and that would be uh, June the 11th, which is on a Thursday, the same day as the Charter Committee was meeting, and June 18th. That gives the city attorney to bring back the item for you on June the 23rd with the city commission meeting. Did you say June 11th? June 11th That's a and June 18th. I'm in July. Yep. In the evenings, right? Yes. Yeah. And that will be a public workshop. So um, okay. we could do it here. We could do it at the Brandon Center. Brandon Center. Brandon Center. Gives us more room to spread out. Okay, June 11th and June 18th for the Charter Review Committee. Um, as far as COVID uh, measures and, and um, reopening plan, as I mentioned to you during the briefing, for us, uh, we will have the staff gradually coming back on June the 1st with reopening for the public on June the 8th. Um, the other items that we have, Obviously, the sport complex activities. Uh, we have the playgrounds. And everything I mentioned is closed up until the end of this month. Yeah. Uh, you have the farmer's markets. Uh, they complained about not having food truck. And obviously, closing Canal and Flagler. Uh, this okay. is an item that some of you said that you want to discuss tonight. Uh, I would suggest that if we do it, let's do it as a pilot project, see how it works, uh, do okay. partially close, in, uh, close off some of the streets and, and, and do that. Um, Real quick, more, Howard, while you're pausing there, I need a motion to extend the meeting by um, at least 15 minutes. So I'll move. Second. Sharon, if you'd call the roll, please. Commissioner McGurk? Yes. Vice Mayor Colodi? Yes. Commissioner Sachs? Yes. Commissioner Hartman? Yes. Mayor Owen? Yes. I'm so going to vote you, no one time. So if you want to maybe just discuss the uh, these couple of items, yeah. this way we could go. Yeah, let's so you got uh, the, the, the car show on Canal Street. That's a very easy one. They don't want to close off the street. They will have parallel parking. They will do it the second Saturday of every month. They will maintain the social distancing and the CD uh, guidelines, so they want the commission blessing. S Staff has no problem with that. See, I don't, I don't, not closing the street prom doesn't promote social distancing. Like, that's where you get your distances to me in the street. So I'm, I'm, I'm with the mayor on that. I'm not understanding why the, they don't want to close the street. What's the incentive? I think they're saying it's less. They're, they're thinking it's less of an event, but I, I don't think it is. It's the same event. Just in, this, dent, in a more dense this setting. This is not the time of the year when it's usually busy anyway. But That's yeah. what they mentioned to David, that they want to just have a part of a parking and, and, uh, and do that. So. Well, that shuts everybody on to the sidewalk. That's it, and we've opened outdoor seating to some of these restaurants. So on the sidewalks, yeah. The sidewalks. So, so I support opening it back up, but only with associated street closures. If they want to scale that back a little bit, that's fine. So that's my thoughts. Ever, anybody opposed to that? We have a little more conversation, uh, and I'd like to insert the fire chief, if I may. Sure. Chief, I Do have to put you on the spot. I know we did converse about this before, um, and I should have given you a heads up. But we we may see breaches of social distancing, according to CDC guidelines. People can't help it. You know, your friends, your buddies, you're drinking, you're loose. It's going to happen, especially on Flagler. We don't see it so much on Canal. But, Chief, I've spoken to a couple of clinicians, doctors, nurses. They're okay with it. Are, what are your thoughts on an event of this sort? It certainly is not something that I would, that we need to just carte blanche apply to everything. Um, we don't understand the behaviors that these people are going to exhibit. Because we, I mean, I've seen people walking through Publix or Home Depot and behave poorly. So when we open up a street to a, you know, to a restaurant, not, not bars, you know, but restaurants, things like that, we're going to, we need to tread lightly. And, and, you know, if it's a one-off event, C 
see how successful we are on it. Right. Thanks. That's a good point. I, I, I noticed you're looking at both sides, and I, I appreciate that. So you want to do one Saturday and see how it goes and before we approve any more of them? I would try it the second Saturday. Are we talking just the car show or? The car the, show. Okay. Well, I thought we were on the car show. Yeah, uh, that's, we are. I, I'm okay with that. Try it. I mean, they only do it once a year. I mean, once a month. So we can just approve it for the June one, right? I mean, the, yeah, June one. Mm -hmm. Is that what they're asking for? Okay. Okay. So uh, we're okay with that? All right. No I'm problem. All right. I got four four okays on that. Um, Sports complex and playgrounds. Sports complex. Uh, let's let's go playgrounds. Let's just pause on playgrounds. Thoughts. Uh, I'm I'm okay reopening as of June first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, yes, reopen on June 1st. All right. Thoughts? What's our plan? Are we going to disinfect every day, once a week, not at all? I'm not disinfecting every day, but uh, um, depending on if we have the stuff or we have to bring uh, a company to do it. So. Here's my concern about a playground. It, there's no way that groups of kids can play on it and do any kind of social distancing. Right. You're forced into a very small area. And it's at the discretion of there's no single person there who's in charge to help try to monitor this or give direction or leadership. So I wouldn't mind holding off on playgrounds for until the next meeting just to see where the numbers are coming back at. I mean, we had 14 kids test positive in the last two weeks in Volusia County. If, if I may interject, guys, these, these are the things that we took criticism for. We, we're trying to, I think we're trying to save lives. We're, I'm, I'm unsure of this disease. And that's why I said close the bathrooms, close the playgrounds. These are metal and plastic surfaces. We, we can't stand there with a bottle of bleach and clean them. So Commissioner McGurk is, is being, I don't think he's being overly cautious. But, you know, the skate park, that was another thing. Oh, <laughs> I feel bad for the kids and the parents, sure. But we've got lives to consider, too. And then again, there's the mental qualities of life. And so where do we find the balance? It's yeah. all timing. When, when do we decide to open up? Look, I, I have young kids. We're not going to go to the playground. But if somebody else wants to go to the playground, it's a free country. I mean, I just... I. I I have, uh, you know, I have concerns with, yeah, anyway. I, I, well, there's nothing that makes them have to go or take precautions. I'm going to go on the playground for two more weeks. All right, hold off for two more weeks. Yeah, we had two I'm for I'm opening it now. You're well, uh, I, hold for two more weeks. The more Changing I think about it is uh, I can hold off for two more weeks. So How about the bathrooms, guys? The ninth. So holding off on playgrounds for two more weeks. Uh, Commissioner Sachs asking you questions that include the facilities there. Well, that's the big question. The bathrooms are metal surfaces. So whatever, whatever we're doing now, I mean, we have it closed, right? The bathrooms yeah. are closed, yeah. along on. with uh, with the playground. The only bathrooms that are open is the parking lots on the beach. So the what are the things I changed my uh, my thoughts on is I just think of some of the larger playgrounds on the beach like 27th Street and the number of people that go to the beach so you're going to have crowds of kids there so please uh, chief do you know I don't want to get into a debate on the virus because frankly it's, it's I can at this point we're at that point where we can find an expert that will back up whatever opinion you hold. Like, that's just where we're at. So, but my understanding was it doesn't necessarily live on a surface, like a metal surface outdoors in the sun and heat. It didn't necessarily live on that surface for very long. That's correct. 
the the exposure to the outdoors definitely shortens its lifespan dramatically. Uh, so so hard surfaces outdoors is a whole lot more um, a whole lot better surface for it to land on than you know in interior climate controlled type areas. Um, so, so in that regard, if you're talking about outside equipment, it's hard to say that that, yeah. that you know disinfecting is going to be impossible. However, but there's just no way for us to keep to follow every child around. And, yeah, I mean, because it, because the effectiveness is only good for the next time until somebody touches it. And that, I mean, so unless we're you know, so yeah, we, I mean, it feels good though. I mean, it's like TSA. It feels good to have it there. You feel protected. Ninety six percent of the handguns get by the TSA. Just for the record, <laughs> they've done the studies. It's it's it's, it's security theater. Um, all right, playgrounds were closing for two more weeks. Ba that includes bathroom facilities. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, sports, sports complex. Sports complex. So I got some opinions on that. I got a kid in sports out there. Okay. Um, all the youth sports are opening up. And um, there's, uh, and I can tell you that most of the parents are sending their kids back. I probably will not send my kid, although my kid plays soccer. And they're going to run drills. They're just practicing. And they're going to be running drills that are not going to be contact. The kids aren't going to be having contact. So I'm, due to it's outdoor in the space, and so it's the exact opposite of a park. You're going to have a coach, and that coach is going to, uh, the intention is to show some leadership to keep kids separated. Um, is it perfect? No. Um, I'm concerned about it. My daughter has not started gymnastics yet, although the gym has opened up. We haven't put her back. But I think the sports complex in an open-air environment that has coaches out there monitoring the kids is the exact opposite of the playground where there's no one monitoring other than individual parents. The kids are all condensed onto one little playground place area playing with each other. So I'm willing to open up the sports complex. I have a question. Okay. Yes. Uh, could we open it up with uh, capacity restrictions? We can definitely put restrictions in terms of the amount of people that can be out there. Uh, we would just have to work with the different groups that are out there on a given night and, you know, soccer, if it's going to be just a round number, it's going to be 50 people, you know, soccer can get 20, baseball can get 20, and softball can get 10 one night, or, you know, we would just have to work out the details. But we can. It's like acres, though. Yeah. I mean, you Baseball plays nowhere near soccer, so right. you're saying. Uh, that... Right. Yeah. I mean, I... But it would be, you know, one of the things that we were looking at, if we were going to open it up. Some of it depends on if you want to open it up for practices. When do games start? Do we have tournaments? You know, for practice purposes, we can tell all the groups it's one team per field. So one team per soccer field, one team per baseball field, one team per softball field. That's 10 to 12 kids on a field. You know, it's the bigger issue, quite honestly, is going to be the parents all congregating in the parking lot in terms of practices. There. <coughs> Games are a different scenario. They're adults. <laughs> That's, I agree. If they don't congregate in our parking lot, they're going to go somewhere else and congregate. Well, I mean, I the can't sports complex that. allows, for example, me. If I see a group of parents, I don't have to right. stand next to them. I get to make that choice. The key Plenty to me is going to be the leadership of the coaches. And I got to tell you, I'm not sure. You know, like I said, my son probably will not start up right away. I'm still waiting to watch these numbers over this past month. Um, but there was a very eloquent um, letter sent out by a coach in a, in a surrounding city about baseball uh, opening back up. And the coach, it was, it was a great reference to the fact that he, to him it wasn't worth it because he can't guarantee the kid's safety. So I think the adults are going to have to make the decision for their kids and the adults are going to have to make the decision on whether or not they want to group together, which we know they generally will. But again, it's an outdoor, it's so big and outdoor and open that, you know, to say we can have restaurants open and various different things, I, sports complex, I'm, I'm comfortable with. All right, so we had one, for the sport. you had a question, and did that answer your question? 
Yes, uh, I would like to see some type of capacity, and that can be per field. I understand that somebody a quarter mile away is not going to get infected, okay. no matter how hard they sneeze. But and, and it is supervised, so yes, right. I, I'm in favor okay. of it with so some capacity have, limitations, uh, and you know, just, especially for practice. Anything in just delegating that. Capacity to staff. We can't debate capacity up here. No. So just staff delegating reasonable capacity and uh, with the authority to adjust that. Comfortable with that? Yeah, so absolutely. we have three that are comfortable with that. Um, yes? Would it be just for practices right now for opening, or are we opening for, you know, because, for example, soccer, after two or two weeks or so, they're going to start games. Our senior softball program wants to start games. You know, if our baseball is going to start running, you know, they're going to want to start games in two to three weeks after practices. Those are just the next questions that are coming. I'm, I'm so, in, go ahead. so we talked a little bit today about this, and we certainly could put a more emphasis on the coaches to police these issues rather than us trying to police these issues. And we could limit one parent per child, you know, recommend that you carpool, you know, one parent for a couple kids or something like that. So we could. No, that's uh, not that's good. I can tell you functionality <laughs> that's not necessary. Yeah, no, but the biggest problem for the games and opening it up is contact with each other. It, and it's not going to be the kids because the kids are going to have contact. And you're not going to stop them, but it's the adults that I would be more concerned about. Yeah, and, and, and you know. The bottom line is you're not going to control the adults. No. And you're going to get into fights and you're going to. God. Uh, People are bringing assault weapons into buildings over this issue. So I think two weeks open up the sports complex and then for practice and then two weeks of games. I agree. I'm good with that. Okay. Again, with staff having full authority to put common sense measures in place, I don't, not a stands full of people necessarily. So, And I want to say this. When these numbers start spiking, yeah, yeah. it's not happening. It's all bets off, yeah. I'm going to be the first one saying we we'll need to call an emergency out. meeting. Yeah, I mean it's that's yeah. Uh, one one last question: Are you comfortable with that responsibility? Yeah, you know we can we that's can it. talk to the different affiliates. Um, okay. You know, and then in in two weeks, are we waiting till the next commission meeting, or in two weeks, I can start telling them that we can start holding games and tournaments and things like that, and all the stakeholders. I think or unless you hear otherwise. So yeah. To open it, and then two weeks. Two weeks from there, unless we see. Uh, yeah. Something. Unless we, unless you hear otherwise. Yeah. And yeah, if the if the data tells us something different, then we'll we'll respond accordingly. All right. Uh, cool. Street. We they didn't get back to the street closures. Um, Flagler Canal. Yes. It's. Um. So, is there support to give staff authorization to work with the merchants and that to at least do a trial program, try it for a week? One or two on each street. I'm not comfortable with Flagler. Okay. Everything's in the residential neighborhoods then. Okay. Canal Street trial programs. Okay. All right. One for Canal. Yeah. Well, you know you, oh, that's right. You were supportive last I'm time. I'm right? for it, but the I do want to have. I want us to give staff some direction on how many days we're talking about and stuff. I, I don't want. I don't want the. I, I think about, we need to put some parameters in place. Okay. How about we set the parameters? It, it falls on us. All right. So, the, okay, go, ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, when I talked to the, the hub, I told them I could be in favor of it, but you need to come up with a plan. You need to tell me what you're going to do. I mean, we have staff busy enough as it is, and they're involved in enough. They need to have a plan. And I would much prefer a Tuesday night doing East Canal and a Thursday night doing West Canal. And if that's going to be what's broadcast out to the community, you're going to have smaller numbers because they're going to realize there's less groups of people or less places are going to be open. But that gives each, each end of the street an opportunity. It also allows for us to have some continuity of traffic patterns. If we close Canal Down completely, there goes all your parking spots. There goes all your traffic movement. But if you do an east and a west, wherever you decide to divide it, at least there's still some traffic movement going through the area. 
and these are all things that, that I talk with Mr. England about. You guys need to have the plan. You need to tell me how many tables you're looking at. You need to tell me what your waiters are going to be doing. And then it's your plan. It's not our plan. Okay. But if you ha have a good plan that the city manager can agree to, um, I don't have a problem with doing it on a trial basis. I'd rather see it done like east of a Tuesday or a Thursday or something like that. I don't think you can do it on flag. It doesn't matter what night of the week it is. They always have traffic. They always have problems. And you can compare ourselves to all the other cities. I can tell you from the people in Winter Park, when they opened Park Avenue for the weekend, it wasn't the hundreds of people they had out in the streets. It was the three, 400 people they had in Central Park bringing picnic baskets and chairs and blankets. And you couldn't move. The guys at the fire station could not get down the streets because of the traffic issues. So it's it's the ancillary things that, that we don't always think about. Yeah. We, we had this problem with the boat ramp. We said, oh, yeah, it's a great idea to open the boat ramp for locals so that th they can at least enjoy the waterways. But l look what we ended up with, you know. So I think if they're going to present a plan that s staff is comfortable with, you know, including who's closing the street, who's pay, you know, who's going to do the barricading, and then, you know, what are their precautions going to be, then it's not something that we told them they had to do. This was their plan. And if they don't abide by their plan, it's their own fault. Okay. Comment, real, Mr. Real, Mayor. Real quick, I need a motion to extend for another 15 minutes, and knowing that's our last, we have 15 minutes to figure the rest of this out. All so. moved. City, uh, Sharon, if you would call the roll, please. Yes. Vice Mayor Pelosi. Yes. Commissioner Sachs. Yes. Commissioner Hartman. Yes. Commissioner or Mayor Owen. Yes. <laughs> it's payback. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, so Commissioner, Commissioner Sachs. When you came forward with the request, the idea of opening the street for dining, I heard no plan. It's not your fault. I just we heard no plan, and it's the same thing that I said to Mr. England. It's I listened to the EDAV meetings. I listened to a few other commerce meetings from Canal. I appreciate all the people coming together to try and hold those streets up, Lagler and Canal. I understand they're dying. So they're dying economically, and God forbid they die the other way. So I'm willing to give them a chance, but they have to have a plan, and we have to set some guidelines. I would say the simplest guidelines, the CDC guidelines, they maintain social distancing, the servers wear masks, they provide plenty of sanitizer, they already have 50% capacity inside, maybe we could offer them, I don't know, what. it depends on the amount of space that each restaurant will get, and don't forget what Commissioner Hartman said, you have uh, Joel, his wife's restaurant, the uh, Thai place is on one end of the street, and then Yellow Dog's on the other end of the street, are we going to close down the whole street? I just pray everybody socially distances <laughs> because, you know, we're, we're treading with fire here and we're making life de death decisions. No, and, uh, let, me, let me be clear. We're not. we're not. Individual citizens are making life and death decisions. But we're, we're not. Allowing, we're, the, no, they're allowed by constitutional anyway, freedoms okay. to make life and death decisions every single day. They choose when they get in the car to wear a seatbelt or not. And, you know, it's like... So that, anyway, that's where, I, that's where that, some of that cuts across me a little bit. Buck stops here. We should, you know, we're going to have to say yes or no to the, to uh, the opening. So, But we don't force anybody to go to it. No. If they but, don't feel safe going to it, then they don't have to go to it. But you know what also? When they come home, and God forbid somebody close to them coughed, sneezed, spread droplets, they brought it home. Okay? People have yeah. other ideas. People don't believe in it. I, I, I believe in it. I believe in it. And I'm taking tremendous precautions for my family, but I think everybody should have the right to take precautions I'm, themselves. I'm so, anyway. To give them a chance um, they have some order. All right. So, my question is my thought, yes, we didn't have a plan because the thought was to allow staff to work with the merchants. And, I mean, we, we've got experts on the team to allow them to work with the merchants and come up with something that they felt was workable on a trial period and we try it once and then they can make adjustments and say yeah that worked or that was way too crowded we're never doing that again and and we can all even give some feedback to that process so 
that was my initial thought. But at this point, I'll, you know, I'll, whatever the commission's pleasure. Uh, I had uh, I spoke with and emailed back and forth with a couple people from the hub, and I, I said the same thing to all of them. Come up with a plan. Then I can support it, even though I didn't support closing the streets to begin with. So uh, okay. I agree with uh, Commissioner Hartman. The ball's in their court, and it should be a trial base. Well, I kind of feel like maybe it didn't start, but when I was saying I wanted I don't want something too detailed. I just want to know no. what days it was going to be. Um, I, you know, I'm assuming when, when Mary and you brought this up last time, it was not on the weekend. I, I'm comfortable with having some real general parameters and saying, you know, have the staff deal with it and say, hey, do what you think is comfortable. I don't want to create, a, you know, I, I don't want all of them. We're going to stymie them if we sit there and say we want all this criteria and then well, we're going to miss some. I mean, because, for instance, closing the one side versus the other, like, that sounds great right now at 10.50 at night when I'm very tired. But there may be something I'm not thinking of that the merchants say, yeah, and the merchants say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't work because of this, or that doubles the cost because of that to set up. You know, like, that's all stuff that I, I trust I have to work out, frankly. But, so we talk about trial runs. I, I see Flagler isn't going to get, it seems like they're in trouble. Why don't we test this out on Canal Street, at least for, at least, you know, they're not, they can't do it on a weekend, and they do it two or three nights, maybe Tuesday, maybe Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I don't know. Let's, I think we should give some direction, see if you guys are comfortable with it, and move on to it. Okay. I would add one thing. If they get to 100%, we don't do this event anymore. They get Open what else? Closing the street. Oh yeah. Get to hundred percent capacity. No, yeah. If, if it's if it's an absolute madhouse, if it looks like the you know Flagler Avenue, that you know during a during well, the Mardi Gras parade, then yeah, we'd shut it out immediately. What and I mean to say is, when when the governor decides you can go to full capacity. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We we don't do these events unless you know, they want to come back later. Yeah, well, that's a different debate for another day. We can discuss something else. I think it'd be a great event to keep going all summer, but. I'm just saying, like, it's I, nice, it, but it's a major inconvenience for the people who live around there. Closing the street to police and fire. Yeah, logistics. Uh, uh, you know, well, that's a different debate. I got nine water. minutes left to wrap the rest of this up, so okay. we'll we'll debate that that's once we're at one hundred percent. So, I can support giving staff the parameter of saying these are the days, and you've heard all the other concerns. You've got the the, the guidance of our experts. Work with the merchants if they want to come for. I agree. A lot of the onus is on them. Um, I just wanted to give you know it's it's very time consuming to have them have to come. Make a plan, bring it to us, then we tweak the. You know, anyway, so two two nights. They can try it two nights between now and our next commission meeting. Two nights. Week two week nights at their discretion. I'm seeing I got four head nods. Two week nights at their discretion between now and our next commission meeting. And That's, I think it should be at their full expense, not our expense. Okay. Just like the Cruiser Club, they they close the streets down. They monitor it. They pay for it, right? They pay for it. Yeah, I don't want to issue a permit or anything like that. I was about to say, I don't want to make them incur expenses, no. but yeah. They want to close the street. Yeah, yeah. All right. This is for both or just one? Just canal. Okay. I think flag good. That's why I think doing the east and the west is easier. You're going to take less barricades to do a half of a street than you are the whole street. And, and maybe. How about we tell staff to make the suggestion? Yeah. It's not a requirement? Yeah. Maybe it's something they think is a good idea. All right. Kyle, did we get. Do we have others? I have one more, I know, but do you have any others? Uh, I have the farmer's markets. The farmer's market. They're, we gave them authorization. The question is just the food trucks, uh, right? Trucks. They excluded the food truck. And okay. The guy was telling me that he... He's a restaurant, that's what he's saying. He does, uh, I guess, uh, take out. So he's like, what's the difference between me and the restaurant? Yeah. All right. So real, real quick, any, con him to go back. I, I don't any concerns the with the food there. truck? I'm okay with it. All right. I'm not saying anything. I got three. I got. I got three on the food truck. Commissioner Sachs, McGurk, and myself. He's not hurting anything. As long as fire signs off on the permitting, so. Okay. All right. What else? Okay, and then the uh, the summer program at Babe James. Uh, I gave you the the outline of the program. Uh, supposed to start on the fifteenth, if the commission wishes. 
limit to 72 students. We're hiring three additional counselors. So we will have one counselor for each eight or nine kids. Um, staff with David and Kimla, they have worked a program. If it's okay, we will broadcast it out. So. so I know it's not ideal. I will tell you, I talked to the leaders of the Friends of Babe James. They were extremely hopeful that the city could support this. They mm -hmm. talked about how important it was in our community. Um, and yes, there's potential negative side effects, but there's also potential not as negative side effects of not having the event. And so I think staff put together a really solid plan. Uh, we've got volunteers that are helping to make some cloth masks that the children can use. Uh, they're doing social distancing. They'll be able to use the park, Pettis Park. So uh, I fully support this, and I hope that you all will. Any concerns with supporting staff's plan My for this program? Concerns is who's going to pay for it. I so, mean, in the past, they've always paid for part of it. And they, they had no fundraiser this year, so those are my concerns. Is who's, whose dime is it? Who's, where's the money coming from? Uh, and I, I asked David to uh, meet with the uh, right. Of James. I'm not sure if he had a chance to meet with them. Uh, I, I I met with a few of them, but we're doing a conference call tomorrow morning based on uh, the direction tonight. Yeah, I mean they indicated to me that they would be sponsoring their routine 75 children. I I learned after that meeting that. I think they fell short of that last year, so yes, that is a question mark. Um, but I missed the discussion. We're talking about friends of the baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was there a cost per child? Was there a cost per child? To the parent or to us? Forty. Well, yes. per child. Yeah, per child. Forty dollars a week. Forty. Forty per week. Yeah. And normally they pay for like seventy or so children with their fundraiser, which they. The county does offer a grant for forty dollars per child for seven weeks. It's just getting those families to fill out the paperwork and take advantage of that, of yes. that money that the county is offering. That includes, you know, three meals. Right. So I would be more comfortable with lower, lower number. I think 75 <coughs> is too many, um, especially because the majority of them are going to be indoors. You're not going to have 36 kids in the gym and, and they all be in four different quadrants. Um, and you, you know, how many kids did we have last year? There was, uh, I believe, we had about 150. Not all so of them came is, every week. This but is almost 50 percent of what we had on the normal case. All right, let me just get the. I got four minutes. So let me just get the. Are you okay with it? Lower numbers. He said. What? What are? What are your thoughts? We got to make a quick decision here. I'm for it as presented. Okay. I got some head nods that were forward as presented. Um, obviously, if the I think if the cost picture is radically different, if you can just let us know. Well, we're gonna. That's yeah. why I told them to discuss with them, yeah. and then we'll. If it's but if that program is there, maybe the onus instead of the fundraising is that they help the parents. Yes. And we get qualif We get them qualified for that program. Is it forty dollars a kid per week? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But the county has a grant for that. Um, Any others that would you didn't get to? Mention to you about the the high school parade. That's fine. The only thing is I want to mention about the short-term rental. You know, the county has got their approval from the Better Business Bureau, so your uh, options, either you go along with the county reopening plan or you opt out. So I don't know if you have to make a decision tonight. Carrie, what happens if we go past 11 o'clock? Um, oh, is all that business rendered it's invalid? It's it's just your rule. Well, I mean, it's not just. It's your rules of procedure. So you we can temporarily amend those technically. All right. Exception. And we need like five more minutes. We're in a state of emergency. I know. Yeah, we're, we're fine. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we going along with counties or are we going rogue? I go with the county because I think the people have been renting anyhow. I got one for going with the county. I've been looking this way a lot. I'll come to you next. See what you're. I agree with the vice mayor. They're doing it anyway. I think I'd rather have them stay in here than coming over on the weekend and parking in the okay. streets. Yeah, two for going to the county. Yeah. All right. Or New Jersey. So we got we got at least three that say go with the county. So we're going with the county. Any um, others? One quick thing, just yep. based on the conversation that you had with Deb Denise, and she called me as well. I just want to clarify one thing. 
she also has made the motion to make the beach only for Volusia County, and it was turned down. So, okay. she she withdrew it, and I, when you look at that, I, I didn't listen to the meeting, but it looks like she withdrew it, and I'm not sure if the attorney weighed in or not. But there's some. I right. believe there's legal issues. To a different issue, but yeah. she made the she made the motion, and right. the 15 million dollars, which was based on the population, with among the 16 cities, and. Uh, we need to give anything has to do with COVID. I mentioned about the police costs that we have during these weekends. That yeah. it's because of well, the because county of COVID, stuff. For so sure. she should, she's going to talk to the county yeah. staff about. They got to set the parameters, and it has to fall under the the federal as well. So is that it? I, I had one last thing COVID related that I wanted to pitch. I had one idea based on tonight's conversation. I don't think it's going to go well, but I got to at least do it. So I was thinking about fireworks, and it really just killed me to have canceled Fourth of July fireworks. And I know we're in good company; a lot of places have. But it got me thinking about if we could do it one of two different ways. One of them's got staffs, not that they're for it or against it, but they just said yes, we could make that work. One, my first idea was, what if we did like smaller shows, like kind of almost neighborhood, like hey, go out to Venetian Bay and do something, go to Riverside District, and yeah, anyway, so a series of much smaller shows. But then I got to think about the sports complex in the airport, and we have a ton of wide open space up there, not just where we could put it, but for other viewing angles. Like, you can see that area, if you just get in the general vicinity, all along US-1, all on the sports complex, in the stands at the stadium, you got tons of space up there that you could have more of a drive-in show and have, uh, you know, just, again, uh, there's plenty of viewing angles because it's an airport. So I guess my question is, will the commission even entertain? I think we should try to put this on for our citizens. And again, if folks don't want to be there, they don't have to be. I think we could host it safely. Yes, it would draw a crowd. Uh, it's the 4th of July. So just wanted to see if anybody's uh, heart could be turned to possibly have some fireworks in the four, on the 4th in New Smyrna Beach. No. We have another meeting before then, right? Yeah, but you gotta, we got to start planning this now. But My, I don't, my preference is that we have it on Veterans Day. Okay. Because we have, we've done away with Memorial right. Day. We can, we yeah. can figure that out between now and then. So you're so on the fourth. I, I'm okay with it if we can figure this out at the sports complex yeah. and we encourage people to stay in their cars. Yeah, it's sports complex slash airport, So by it's the a way. big, yeah, it's a large it's area. Ton, huge area. So I'm for it. If All of Owlsboro could stay in their front yards. They could see right. it. A bunch of your your North Beach could see it. I mean, you could literally. You could see, I mean, your neighborhood, your whole neighborhood could see it from your neighborhood. So I think it. You got the whole FEC railway right away that people could park in and see it Listen, for miles. Here's so. my idea. Worst case scenario, there's a huge influx in in cases, and everything's starting to hit the fan. We cancel. We could always cancel. Yeah, you always pull out. So yeah, we could take a hit on the money, but you know what? I think that uh, I've talked to enough people. And we've all talked to it. I think a lot of us have seen on social media as a big disappointment. So I would rather commit to it, and then if there's if the sky's falling, we back out. Of it. All right. So yeah. Is there anything planned on the fourth for the sport tournament or anything? Not, not, not at this time. No. All right. Don't. Our new artificial turf isn't. It won't, it won't be in by then. Will be it be in construction? Be in construction. All right, so we wouldn't be able to use the field. I was thinking you could even open up some of the fields and people could have, you know, anyway. So is there an FAA rule against yeah, that? They've the already cleared that. The thing is we have, to, uh, uh, we have to make a request to the FAA, and it takes about 30 days. Um, you know, we've done it during the uh, balloon fest. You know, we closed off the air. So Rhonda has to make If you request. say yes, we can do it. Question, are other cities doing fireworks around us? No. No. Edgewater was, I thought. We're all going to come here. They canceled. Oh, did they? Obviously, did. I mean, we're, I'm glad we're phasing things back in, but that's my my wish is that we phase, see what happens. Yeah. we got plenty of time to back out of it. Yeah, we can, we can plan it and back out. Because, again, we're going to be one of the only folks in town with a contract for fireworks, so we could probably put whatever terms we wanted in that contract, frankly, because they don't have any other business. No. All right. No. Commissioner Hartman has spoken. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm off in the deciding vote, so I'm, I'm going to lay this one right on you. But I mean, they're going to have fireworks on the beach anyway, so. That's oh, yeah. what I told you. Okay. Um, Nobody listens to me. 
That's a no. Yeah, it was it was a yes from me and Commissioner McGurk. Uh, all right, city clerk's report. We did have one item um, on the public participation at the charter review committee. My fault. I just explained. My fault was that we wouldn't have that because that's when the charter review committee is just handing us their work. So the public's talk to them, and the public's gonna talk to us. But does the public need to talk while we're trying to talk? But um, out of the abundance of caution, I'm suggesting that we allow public participation at that meeting as well, as we normally do at a workshop. It just may take a little more time. So, everybody okay with that? All right. But that was the thought process of why we weren't going to have it initially, is because we're not making any decisions. It's literally just them saying, hey, here's what we worked on. Do you have any questions? So, uh, was there anything else, or was that the only item? No. Nope. Uh, qualifying week for the 2020 elections is June 8th through the 12th. It's coming up in 13 yeah. days. Too many, too many more 11 so o'clock nights. General public, if they want their name on the ballot, they have to turn in their paperwork that week during qualifying week. Okay. Not just general public, even anybody. Everybody. Uh, city attorney's report. Is that it? Sorry. Yes. And a it. fantastic job has been done tonight and at the last meeting by Sharon. City so, Sharon. City Sharon. It's in the new nickname, City Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> so, we really appreciate it. I know no one more than Kelly. The, the peace of mind of knowing she's got a backup. I mean, you haven't had that for a while now. So yeah. we Great. all we all are very thankful. So fantastic. And she's job. had two long meetings, so she'll think this is the norm. Uh, yeah, right. So if we ever get out at 8 o'clock, she'll be like, I don't know what to do with myself. City attorney, anything? No report. All right. This meeting is adjourned. Round it to 11 o'clock.